Yes, hello. Now we've made it online in these in these problematic times. We've got some very important issues discussed now. A, a topic which has been much neglected um, in in the academic debates, in the wider open debates. We've got a wonderful lineup of speakers, and I'm extremely happy now that we've put together this wonderful event. Um, yeah, Leo and I. Leo, we met 2017, no? Yes. Yeah, we met uh, 2017. On, on, and we di re realized sort of we are part of the same transhumanist uh, uh, association, the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. And as a consequence, no, we, we already then started talking about putting putting together such an event on this topic. Um, yeah. Um, Today, yeah, so Leo and I um, have been organizing this event. Uh, Betsy and Rai will be the moderators of the event. We've got an uh, absolutely amazing lineup of speakers. Um, and now I'm passing on the word directly to Leo, who will be, say a couple of introductory words. So, Leo. Yeah, um, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending in which part of the world uh, you are today. And a warm welcome to this seminar on transhumanism and Africa. My name is Leo Igwe. I'm co-organizing this event with Professor Stefan Sogner from John Carbot University. Now, this seminar is an invitation to discuss how transhumanism relates to Africa, but it's also an opportunity to rethink and reconceptualize Africa. There's still a lot missing in how Africa has been framed, how Africa has been portrayed and rep represented in popular literature, in academic literature. At a time that the COVID-19 pandemic has forced profound changes in the way human beings live and relate. A seminar on transhumanism in Africa is timely because it compels us to update our thinking, to upgrade our thinking, to disrupt our supposition and presuppositions. And of course, improve our thinking and understanding of the continent. So I'm looking forward to listening to your ideas, views, questions, comments, perspectives, on how the notion of transhumanism could shape the African life situation, and also how the African realities could enrich this social and philosophical movement. So once again, I welcome everyone to this event, and I look forward to a fruitful and productive exchange. Now, over to yes. you, Stephen. Yeah. No, uh, sort of wonderful. Thank you um, for these introductory words. No, it's incredible what we've realized by means of emerging technologies in the past, in particular in the past 200 years. And, um, and this has had enormous consequences all over the world. And actually, it's sort of whenever one talks about these issues in a class, in universities, even to the educated public, um, there is very often um, even not a sufficiently they are not sufficiently aware of how contingent our sort of the situation are in which we live even sort of what has happened that the life expectancy in the past 200 years has has has, has quasi doubled in the average and obviously there was a difference in the various in the various parts of life so if we if we follow the um um the the studies in in europe it's been there was an increase from from 34 to 79 years in, in America from 35 to 77 years in Asia from 70 to 27 to 73 years in Africa from 26 to 63 years. So there have been difference, but altogether we see um, in most parts, there's even uh, it's um, the life expectancy has doubled or has increased three times. And that has only um, happened in the past 200 years in a relatively short lifespan. And in addition, something else I regularly ask my students sort of what they think concerning the developments concerning poverty, for example, global on a, on a global scale, also in, in various parts of the world. And hardly anyone realizes because there's such a widely shared tendency, oh, it used to be better in the past. But then um, when one realizes, so 
about 200 years, there was an absolute poverty rate all over the world in the average of more than 90%. Whereas now this has dropped to 10%. We can see the enormous relevance and impact of emerging technologies. And this doesn't only, um, this is not only relevant to life expectancy and the poverty rate, but we can see that just to many everyday tasks, um, sort of just living without a fridge, living without living without a coffee machine, hot water. This was standard before before 1900. So even in our everyday life tasks, having the technologies have radically changed our our way of life. And um, I think what is particularly interest, uh, interesting, important is sort of the focus on the consequences for the issue of health. So we've got quite a few presentations which will address the increase of the health span and the various possibilities for, for doing so by means of emerging technologies. And, and obviously um, vaccinations, medicine have done an enormous job. Um, for example, vaccination uh, uh, treatments concerning HIV positive people. In 2014, 41 of adults living with HIV received treatments, only 40% globally. In 2017, the percentage nearly doubled to 79%. So the availability of treatments concerning HIV um, has nearly doubled within a, uh, uh, within a duration of, of, of like, um, a couple of years. So this is what we can see. Emerging technologies have radically um, changed the way we live together and um, have ra radically improved our quality of life, which is so closely connected to our life expectancy or in particular with, with uh, our expected health span. So, um, and now we will focus on these issues and how they relate to the various also um, approaches in various African countries, how they relate to the African philosophies. And I'm already, we've already had some discussions concerning um, Ubuntu plus or trans Ubuntu. And there have been sort of various takes on this issue. I'm, I'm, I'm quite intrigued um, um, and, and looking forward to hearing the further reflections on that specific topic. So in order to really get started, um, I will now um, pass on the words to our moderators and who will be responsible for presenting our first speaker. And it is really an enormous pleasure of mine um, to have Martin Rosplatt here today with us to, to give the first presentation. Um, we've been actually in, in contact um, for about 10 years, I guess. Um, we um, sort of, we, we had some, some she, uh, Martine gave a talk at, at a conference I organized about 10 years ago, I think it was on the beautiful island of Lesbos, where she actually talked about xenotransplantations. Um, and now 10 years later, well, all the things we talked about and she talked about in her presentation then, this is now she has actually realized that she's put it into she, her team, her company has put that into practice and it was realized that a genetically modified pig's heart was actually transplanted into a human being. Um, and that went basically viral. That went through the media all over the world about, yeah, at the beginning of uh, 20, uh, 2022. And that is a, that means a significant shift concerning the possibilities um, of, of, of saving lives, of saving lives, you know, of millions of lives of peoples all over the world. There are hundred thousands peoples only in the United States who, who, who wait for, for organ transplantation. And there's enormous lack of, of donors so far, but with the possibilities of, of using genetically modified pig's heart, um, all these issues can be dealt with. So I'm, I'm extremely happy and grateful that, um, she's with us here today and she'll be giving the opening presentation because I know in particular uh, um, she's got, you know, she's so many requests and, and possibilities and invitations. So many, many thanks. So I'm passing on, on the word to our moderators, uh, Betsy and Rai. Thank you, Professor, and thank you everyone for joining us online. Uh, from wherever you guys are streaming, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Please don't forget to drop your comments or questions in the chat box so we can bring it up to the panelists later on. Uh, it is a great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Martin Rothbelt. She is the chairperson and CEO of United Therapist 
Corporation, which is UT. She started UT to save her younger child's life for a rare illness after having previously created Cerex XM, settled radio and other uh, satellite communication system. She is also responsible for several in in inventions, innovations in our architecture, including the design and piloting of an electric helicopter to Guinness World Records and creating world's largest zero carbon footage uh, uh, buildings. Her company is now saving thousands of lives a year with medicine for polymerase hibernation, hypertension and neuroblossom and by react restoring others, restoring the donor's lungs to trans transplantation, uh, transplantability, sorry. UT is also in preclinical development of manufacturing kidneys, hearts and lungs to be delivered via autonomy, flown electric vertical takeovers and landing, which is EVTOL system. Dr. Roth Rothwelt led the effort to create the first genetically modified cord and heart and kidney transplants into humans, restoring in a living Zeno heart transplanted in January 2022. Dr. Rothwelt earned her PhD in medical ethics at the Royal London College of Medicine and Dentistry after earning GD and MBA degree from UCLA with also recently awarding her with the UCLA Med Medal and Higher Honors. She's an inventor on several pa uh, patents and the author of several books, the rest, the reactions of which pertains article, congression and cyber consultants. So please, Dr. Martin, take the floor. A beautiful introduction. And uh, thank you also, Leo, for uh, hosting this uh, conference together with Stefan. Uh, Stefan, it's so nice to see you again after we last met in Rome and before that in, in Lesbos. So um, it's really good to see you today. Uh, Betsy, also thank you so much for helping to host and organize this conference. I'm um, very excited to, to um, be invited um, to speak at this conference because uh, transhumanism and Africa, they are very important to me. First, with regard to transhumanism, I, uh, I always pay a huge debt of gratitude to Stefan and his colleagues for conceptualization of uh, metahumanism, which I believe is an even um, more important uh, and deeper topic than transhumanism. But I won't have time to get into metahumanism today, but I do really encourage everybody to read up on it. Um, it's not as well known as transhumanism, so probably it, it can't um, gain as much viewers in the, to have it in the title of, of our program today. But um, metahumanism is different and I think in many ways more trenchant than transhumanism. Africa. I'm very happy to speak about this because Africa is actually my favorite continent in the world. It is my favorite continent because I see Africa as the heartbeat of the world. It is um, from uh, where all of uh, culture and civilization arose, and it is now providing the regeneration of human culture and civilization going into the uh, future. So it's uh, to me to blend together transhumanism and Africa, it's going to be like a perfect blend. My, uh, my slideshow today is going to be a little bit different probably from what uh, most academics are used to in um, PowerPoint type of presentations. It's going to be a presentation of art and, um, and poetry. So if you go to, I guess I could change the slides here um, or you guys change it. Yeah. So if you go to the first slide, um, I want to say that um, I'm going to be channeling um, the most Afrofuturistic person who I personally know and I'm friends with, uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor. She is a geologist 
a college professor, an analog astronaut, and the first woman of the African diaspora to pilot a spacecraft. In her case, it was the SpaceX Dragon Starship. Dr. Proctor has developed the concepts of space to inspire and the art of inspiration. This slide shows the cover of her augmented reality book, which of course is available on Amazon. I really encourage everyone to get it because it contains some very transhumanist artwork and poetry, and therefore contains some very deep meanings about transhumanism and Africa. Her artwork and poetry shows very powerfully how transhumanism is rooted in the super diverse yet super united African experience. Next slide, please. Here is a reading of her poem titled, um, I think we might have skipped one, let me see. This is slide three. Yep, okay, good. Yeah, perfect, thank you, thank you. Here is a reading of her poem titled, Afronaut. Darkness, do you feel it? It dances within the bounds of eternity. A black void that represents nothing, yet it is everything. I dance among the universe, unbound by expectations. I live, I laugh, I love, and yet I'm alone in the void. Alone to cast my soul's shadow of light and illuminate my existence. A legacy of DNA, if only for an instance, among the stars. Next slide, please. I hope everybody liked that first one. For me, it kind of gave me shivers <laughs> just uh, reading it. Um, here's another one of Dr. Proctor's poems. Uh, this one entitled Suspended by you. Lifted higher than a dream, gifts given by you. Small symbols of attribution, a sacrifice, bonded trust, connected by the jewels we treasure. Afro Gaia winks with pleasure. Love expressed as transformed trinkets guarded by a dragon's wing, noble jesters tumbled by the awe-inspiring views. Heirlooms transcend time and space, and this reality we call flesh. Together we float with no sense of day into darkness. I feel suspended by you, can you feel it too? So that um, poem was, um, you know, channeled by Dr. Proctor from her actual three-day flight in space as the pilot of the Dragon capsule as it orbited above Africa, Asia, the Pacific, over and over and over. Just like, uh, you know, I think if somebody could could translate being in space into poetry like Dr. Proctor totally crushed doing that. You could, you could feel the experience as real as, as words can let you feel the experience. Here is another um, of her poems, but before I get into it, um, I want to talk about a very transhumanist concept that Dr. Proctor has conceptualized. I would call it a guiding metahumanistic ethic called Jedi, J-E-D-I, or Jedi space. Now, of course, it plays off of the Jedi warrior meme from Star Wars, 
But more important is that the acronym JEDI is easy to remember because, you know, we all know about the Mandalorian and all that. Now, everyone in space transhumanism, I believe, should use uh, Jedi space as a checklist before each stage of each transhumanist project. J, it stands for just. Opportunities in augmenting human limitations with technology should be fairly available to everyone. That's what justice or just means. Second on the checklist is E. E stands for equitable. We must realize that most people have been oppressed for most of history and the lack of resources and stepped up opportunities imposed on oppressed demographics is a super steel and concrete real aspect of reality. So when we are implementing justice, we have to do it with equitableness. We have to ensure everybody has fair opportunities to participate in every part of building the transhumanist future, not just the people who happen to have all of the resources today. Because let's remember, all of those resources belong to all of Gaia, and all of those resources flowed from the oppression of the people who originally gave them reality. Now D, the D in Jedi, it stands for diverse. Diversity is not only a way to ensure more justice and more equity, but it is also the most important tool for ensuring lasting human success. One of transhumanism's patron saints, Darwin, I know many transhumanists celebrate um, Darwin Mass instead of Christmas, so that's, that's pretty much in the patron saint category. Darwin realized that diversity, he called it back in the 19th century variation, means really the same thing, was key to success in natural selection. And it's also going to be key to success in the what you could call artificial selection of a techno-culturistic, metahumanistic civilization. The last letter in the JEDI acronym I stands for inclusive. This means that we must walk the talk. It accomplishes very little to be just equitable and diverse in form only, but in practice to exclude from top positions those who are not traditional beneficiaries of privilege. Inclusive means to embrace being just, equitable, and diverse in every part of all of our transhumanist projects. Now, I really like um, this next poem called My Genie. I think it is my favorite. I told Dr. Proctor it was my favorite because it kind of summarizes the Jedi Creed. Manifested from stardust, resonating day into night, always present, always watching, always ready. Oops, back one slide. There you go. Um, potential energy continuously constrained, bonded beyond the limitless light, treasure waiting to be hunted, alchemy whispering deep from within. I hear you. I see you. I touch you. My genie emerges, a flickering, flickering reflection. I am ready to be the best version of me. I am ready to be the Jedi version of me. Wow, isn't that an awesome poem? You go, Dr. Proctor. Okay, next slide. Okay. 
All righty. Dr. Proctor defines, uh, she actually in her book defines Afrofuturism as the exploration of the intersection between humanity's future and African culture. Of course, we are all Africans, just as assuredly as we are all humans. We are also all transhumans, just as assuredly as we were once all transhumans. I'm going to spell that because it's not a word that I think whatever auto transcription program might be running will recognize, but it's a real word. It's spelled T-R-A-N-S-H-U-M-A-N-C-E, transhumance. It rhymes with trans romance. So, you know, that's a good start right there. Now, the two words transhuman and transhumance can be said to be quasi homophones. They sound almost the same, transhuman, transhumance, but they mean something different. Transhuman means to use technology to transcend human limitations. We've been doing that for at least a million years. That's why I said before, of course, we are all transhumans. Transhumance rhymes with trans romance, means to migrate on a seasonal basis, such as between high pastures in the summer and valleys in the winter. The word is a portmanteau of the Latin words trans, meaning across, and hummus, meaning ground. Humans have practiced transhumance on every continent from time immemorial. Now, I do not believe we need to limit the definition of transhumance to pastures and valleys. And indeed, people worldwide periodically migrated across the hummus, across the ground, for many, many reasons. In this 20th century, we can respect our migrating ancestors and our migrating contemporaries by reclaiming and revitalizing transhumance to mean willing to move across geography for greater life. Africa has transhumance in its DNA, and thus so do we, so do we all. For multiple times, we walked across Africa, we walked out of Africa, spread throughout the world, and respread throughout the world. Africa is transhumance. Humans are transhumance. Now, what happens when you combine our transhuman technology with our transhumance nature? You get migration not only across the hummus or ground, but also across the water, across the air, and across the atmosphere, and across the orbits about the Earth and across the trajectories to the planets, and ultimately across the black voids of Dr. Proctor's poetry to the stars of our Orion Spur, of our Sagittarius arm, inside the Perseus arm of our mighty, magnificent Milky Way galaxy. So to me, the product of transhumanism and Africa is the product of transhumanism and transhumance, which is a compulsion to cross geographic spaces, including cosmographic spaces, and to do so always with Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you very much. Many thanks for that wonderful presentation. Um, it's been absolutely beautiful. And I, I particularly liked actually that you stressed sort of the importance of diversity 
so so much sort of that sort of what also connects with with meta humanist approach and and this has been a very which has been so widely shared um uh, which has been widely shared for transhumanism and many people in the in the public media actually when they talk about transhumanism it's just the idea of sort of um, the Superman or the Wonder Woman who gets realized, but this is, it's so important rather to stress the diversity and not sort of just the amplification of our traditional ideas and sort of, of binary understandings, but a moving towards a greater plurality, a greater diversity. And this is, I think, um, the, the issue which is so 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 most important for for both of us and for for many of us i think here also today and this is something which ought to be shared and stressed much further that it's not just the traditional humanist ideal which gets towards a hyper humanism um, um but there's a great plurality of flourishing one shouldn't reduce anything to the traditional binaries but allow the the great plurality of diversity of flourishing and this is this is sort of the meta humanist flourishing which i've always been you know talking about trying to stress that it shouldn't be reduced to to the various categories of which we how we've traditionally conceptualized the world and this is what i particularly like when when you sort of stress these issues and um, by by reading these these poems um so many many thanks um and this has been shared also by i just want to highlight this yeah natasha vita moore is here in the audience as well beautiful martin the best version of transhuman and this is um yeah i i completely agree leo <laughs> i Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much for the presentation, and uh, I found it quite inspiring. Um, I I read a bit about you and about your work, and I must tell you that uh, I didn't know so much <laughs> about you and what you've been doing. I have, I just listened to your TED talk yesterday, and uh, God. An, an idea um, of uh, what you've been doing and the, the amazing work. So um, just in line with that, I was thinking about, uh, you know, just like, you know, you, you try to talk about uh, Afrofuturism and uh, exploring humanity's future uh, and Africa. I am thinking about this in practical terms. Yes, I'm thinking about this in practical terms. Do you think that there are projects and initiatives in line with what you've been doing already we can use to translate or at least initiate schemes that will give us a practical perspective or pointer to this future? You have painted, you have, you have configured, you have conceptualized this in a way that I find fascinating. And uh, given that, um, you know, from the profile we read and, uh, and what we, the introduction, you know, the amazing work you're doing, I am interested and I'm coming to this conference to ask you, is there any project within your own purview we could initiate to give a practical slant to this Afrofuturism so conceptualized? Wow, well, thank you very much, uh, Leo, for your appreciation. And thank you very much, uh, Natasha. So wonderful to uh, see your voice on the on the chat that was uh, coming from the inventor of the concept of transhumanism. That's a um, wonderful thing to, to for my ears to hear. So thank you so very much, uh, Natasha. Uh, Stefan, I also... Um, I'm so grateful that you see the uh, close uh, nexus with metahumanism and the Jedi insistence upon uh, diversity. You know, uh, Leo, with regard to practical application of these different uh, biotechnologies and uh, geotechnologies and uh, space technologies, um, within the uh, African continent, I think the time has never, ever been better than uh, right now. 
I have just been uh, uh, reviewing a, uh, a pre-publication version of um, Ray Kurzweil's uh, latest book, which is called The Singularity is Nearer. You know, his last book was The Singularity is Near. That was written, I guess, about uh, 10 years ago or so, something like that. So now he has done a complete and absolute rewrite of the book from beginning to end. And um, with um, even twice as many of his famous charts and graphs showing how quickly all these things are arising. And the number one conclusion that he reaches, um, I'm still just like halfway through reading it because it's like, <laughs> it's, it's really a thick book. <laughs> um, but um, uh, one of the points he makes, which is the point he made in The Singularity is Near, is that because of the law of accelerating returns, which is the feedback loop that information technology contributes to itself, information uh, allows there to be feedback to improve the information and to improve the information so that as... Um, Natasha uh, Vita Moore's partner, Max Moore, uh, described um, we end up having extropianism that outcompetes entropy. Extropy outcompetes entropy because of this law of, um, of accelerating returns that we get from information. And what Kurzweil points it out in this new book is this is the the rapid availability of 3D printing, both of zero carbon buildings and of bio structures, organs, medicines, etc., um, is going to be available at every point on the Earth's surface, because no longer will you need to have these super capital intensive, legacy rooted. Uh, um, buildings and infrastructure like, you know, Stanford University or Harvard University or Massachusetts General Hospital um, or similar facilities in uh, Europe and whatnot. Because of the ubiquity of global communication at a high speed, um, we will be able to have the um, access, all of the knowledge of humanity on every single corner of the earth. And with the 3D printing, we could then transform um, like the alchemy that uh, Dr. Proctor speaks about in her poem. Um, with 3D bioprinting, you're able to transform the information world into the physical world. Okay, that's the beauty of the uh, 3D bioprinting. Now we have with the um, Starlink system, which um, is going up and, and here people like 10 years ago would think I was crazy if I said, oh, they will launch these satellites hundreds at a time. Uh, no, they actually are launching <laughs> these satellites hundreds at a time. And um, within the couple years, the entire world will be uh, surrounded by what Arthur C. Clarke called the nervous system of humanity we will have finally achieved this nervous system of humanity. So we'll have high data rate uh, information available everywhere in the world. And nor will, um, nor will Starlink you know, have a monopoly on this because there are at least two other companies right on top of it. Just like um, the world is um, already necklaced in the US GPS system. And then it was only you know, right on top of that the uh, Russian GLONASS system, right on top of that, the European, the Chinese. So now we've got like four, maybe soon five different GPS systems all around the world. And there will be four or five different types of Starlink systems all around the world. So bandwidth and knowledge is going to be as cheap as say um, posts on social media, which are of course, you know, practically free, as well as Wikipedia, and so much of the rest of the knowledge that Stefan referred to, which is of course, practically free. So already, as you see that, uh, that African entrepreneurs innovated 
to be at the cutting edge of redefining even the concept of money by using information technology and mobile communication to give, give rise to you know, the first wave of e-finance, you're going to see a replication of this in so many different aspects of the physical environment that I would say there has never been a better time to start businesses in the technology realm in Africa than right now. Many thanks. We've got, and we've got loads of praises, by the way, here um, um, for your Immortalist magazine, just mentioning um, We've got others just to say how all the excellent presentation. And yes, uh, we've got a question from Natasha Vita more as well. No, Rai, could you read yes, it? Yes. Uh, thank you, Natasha, for sending in your question. This is for Dr. Martin. Uh, she was asking if you, if you would write a book on apartheid of, of ignorance, what might the key message be? Hmm. Wow, that's a that's a deep uh, question to to think of an answer, you know, on the spot. But um, you know, it is. Um, I I actually am inspired by what it's the theme of this conference about uh, transhumanism and Africa, and what uh, Stefan you had shared about the criticality of um, diversity and how that is the key message of um, metahumanism, okay? And um, it's kind of like, you know, if you imagine an algorithm that can combine numbers and produce a beautiful result, you could say, okay, wow, that's a great algorithm. I could do long division. I could calculate square roots. I can do all sorts of things, okay? And um, we have the, you know, the ancient Arabs and the Indians before that to thank for these numerals and these uh, calculations. Now imagine that uh, we took like every other uh, uh, line of the algorithm and we just disappeared it. You know, we took it out. Well, you, you can't do long division or calculate square roots or calculate uh, geometric shapes or calculate physics or anything if you'll have only half of the formula, okay, uh, you might be able to add a couple numbers together. You might be able to subtract two, but you're not going to be able to get to the magic of multiplication, division, not to mention all the rest of technological society. So when we have ignorance, okay, when we don't practice justness, equity, diversity, and inclusion, it's like we are disappearing half of all the uh, information that we need to create a better world. And so when we have a apartheid of uh, ignorance, when we have half of the people deprived of information and opportunity, and the other half the people, they have it, the whole human project is ground down to a very low level. We don't have these opportunities to, as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, to cross the atmospheres and the skies and the orbits. Okay, we could cross maybe the ground and the waters, uh, been there, done that. How about the orbits to the planets? How about to the nearest stars? How about the rest of just the arm of our own, the spur, just the our little spur, Orion spur off of the Sagittarius arm? We cannot have ignorance. We can't spare any ignorance. We have to take it as a fundamental human obligation not just a human right, but more important, a human obligation for each of us and whatever we can do to make sure to, that there is no ignorance any place on our planet. Many thanks, Martin, for your wonderful words, for your presence here. Hopefully in the future, you will be back again also at John Cabot University sometime, maybe with an event on metahumanism, diversity, which would be absolutely amazing. Many, many thanks. It's been an absolute pleasure and honor, see, you know, pleasure for me seeing you again. Hopefully we'll be meeting up in person sometime soon. And, you know, all the best for your absolutely amazing work, which is really, you're putting, you know, trans metahumanism rather into practice. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Leo. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank Beth you so much. Yeah. Live, live yeah. So I'm passing on Betsy. 
you're right there to present with our next presenter, Martin. Bye bye. Yes. Um. So our next presenter is Professor Thomas de France. Um. I'll introduce him really quick, and then we will um have him join us. So, um, Professor de France. Uh, directs slippage, um, performance, culture, and technology. He received uh, the 2017 Outstanding Research and Dance Award from the Dance Studies Association, and he contributed um, concept and voiceover for a permanent installation on Black social dance at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, he has also thought, taught at the American Dance Festival, Ponderosa, New Waves Dance Institute, as well as MIT, Stanford, Yale, um, Coll uh, Hampshire College, Duke, and Northwestern, um, and also the University of Nice. He specializes in African diaspora aesthetics, um, dance historiography, and intersections of dance and technology. And he's a contributing author in books such as um, Companion to African American Theater and Performance, um, Choreography and Corporeality, Relay in Motion, um, Performance Theory, and Anthology of Critical Readings. Um, and he believes in our shared capacity to do better and engage our creative spirit for a collective good. That is anti-racist, proto-feminist, and queer affirming. Um, I would like to <laughs> welcome Professor <laughs> de France. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It's terrific to be here among friends. Hello, Stefan. Hello, Leo. It's a pleasure. And thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I have um, some comments and some ideas to share, and then we'll have some conversation. So I guess we just go, yes, it's okay? Okay, thank you, Leo, I see you. So um, I'm very excited about this gathering and this thinking together around questions of the human, the transhuman, the metahuman, and especially the the possibility of the continent and the people of Africa, if you will. I position myself as an African American, of course, uh, born in, you know, born and sort of come into life in what we now call the United States. Um, but I'm extremely concerned and uh, uh, entangled in thinking through our, our various sort of diasporas and the ways that we meet and unmeet through our questions of the human and questions of um, a sort of possibility of an ontology of care um, among people. Uh, I have some comments that are, are going in around five different points that I, I want to see if we can tussle with together. And I do want to start with Afro-pessimism and this idea of becoming human, um, which really maybe for me has been a part of my interest in, in thinking alongside you in these spaces of metahuman and transhuman. Um, there's a way that in Black thought or Black studies, especially in the United States, and I want to be sure to, to, to say that I'm, I'm focused on how theoretical um, formations have been shaped in the context of the United States. Uh, this question of Afro-pessimism and of the, the idea that Black people have been configured in the West as being outside of the human actually, uh, I think, offers us a kind of... Um, possibility as we imagine transhuman and metahuman um, as we focus on how Black people, especially in the context of the United States, have uh, survived and pushed out a possibility of care, tenderness, weathering storms, um, survival, art making, creative world fashioning, et cetera, et cetera, and on and on and on. So for me, this question of the metahuman and the transhuman is entirely tied up with uh, a very um, recent turn towards the Afro-pessimist. And I wanna uh, start with some ideas that I'm borrowing from Zakia Mon Jackson. I wanna uh, think through these ideas together with you. I'm gonna share some slides um, that are from uh, Professor Jackson's book, uh, Becoming Human, Matter and Meaning in an Anti-Black World, because they'll give us a way to kind of form a couple other points I'd like to make in this short presentation today. And this book is um, just from last year, the publication. Professor Jackson has been working in philosophy and black thought for a number of years. And this, this particular offering 
it's super helpful for me as I try to understand a possibility of a transhuman and the work of the metahuman in relationship to black thought in the context of the US. Um, Jackson wants us to think maybe about blackness as plasticity. So there's a way that Jackson's text uh, um, demands that we think about blackness as a fungibility or as a something that's a notness. And, um, you know, that's, that's, it's not that it's not, it's that it's something that can be stretched, extended, shared, and um, um, distended. So this idea that in Jackson's thinking of the human, blackness becomes something that can exceed and also determine the human at the same time. It does both at once because it is the, the space of the both and rather than the either or. Even though traditionally we've been trained to think of blackness as the or, you know, like the alterity, the difference itself. Um, what if we start to understand blackness and in, by extension, by way of extension, um, blackness on the continent of, of Africa as the kind of alternative that's already embedded within a future past. So here's Sankofa, here's Ubuntu, here's the human ritual, here's the looking back to go forward, but it's all about a kind of stretching out that's already in motion because we have an actual sort of category of existence that is distinguished by its ability to be human and non-human at the same time. So Jackson calls this plasticity a mode of transmorgification where the fleshy being of blackness is experimented with a form where form shall not hold. So if we follow Jackson, who's a kind of leading Afro-pessimist thinker, although I don't know that she would like that determination at all, we need to ask her and invite her to be in these conversations in the future. Um, if we follow this thinking, there's a way that the form of the human does not hold in relationship to blackness or black people. Um, and so black thought gives us a way to understand something that exceeds the human and also defines the human simultaneously. And it's this plasticity that I think is especially of use to us as we're thinking through um, metahuman and transhuman sort of possibilities. Jackson thinks about blackness at an edge of legibility so blackness becomes the thing that we can't not see, but it's also the thing that we can't see at the same time. So the centrality of gender, sexuality, and maternity um, are all mobilized following Jackson in the animalization of blackness. So Jackson's also concerned in this turn towards the non-human, in this question of animalization as a kind of negativity. So the animal being less than the human, if we follow Western philosophical thought, um, but those of us in this conversation might understand the animal, if you will, or the insect or um, the aquatic as being um, co-constitutive to human. So human not as the register of life or liveliness even, um, but the something else-ness that be next to human or beyond human can do, maybe metahuman or transhuman or about beyond human, maybe not. But this idea that in blackness, we have something that is defined outside of the human regularly. So then something else becomes possible because of this illegibility, this thing near the edge. I wanna just look at a couple more slides from this text and then move on to some other points. Um, this idea that the African and Western philosophy, and, and Jackson is very good on Western philosophy and the idea of the African. Um, so, you know, she's not necessarily claiming African identity for herself. That's, that's up in the air in terms of how this text plays itself forward, but she's quite good in helping us think about how the African or the Black have been constituted in Western philosophy. And she helps us reflect on this never attaining imminent differentiation. So the Black inside this, this formation, which precedes the transhuman or the metahuman, is always... Um, a, a bit outside of self-knowledge, a bit outside of immediacy, and it's always a little bit out of step or out of time. So ahistorical somehow. So this sort of Western philosophical bent or foundational thinking that places Africanity, Blackness, Black people 
outside of the modern um, produces a quality of being, and this is me now elaborating as best I can, this produces a condition where we actually have pre-acceleration towards the transhuman or the metahuman through a consideration of blackness because black people and black thought have been considered outside of Western philosophy or as the alterity, the difference, the alternate register of you know, Eurocentric thinking or Western thinking, Western philosophy, we actually already have a model for how to get outside of the Western philosophical um, principles that aren't serving us and maybe have never served us. So this is a way for us to understand the biopolitical and move through it or with it, not around it necessarily, but through it and with it as Black people who are designated outside of capital, except as the laboring bodies of capital, but we're still here, we're still having the conversation, we're embedded in technological innovation, and we're embedded in this necklacing or networking that Martine was just talking about. So we actually have modeling and movement through and towards an otherwise way of being, which is how Ashan Crawley likes to describe this, this, this other kind of alterity where it's an inside and outside that's simultaneous. Um, so imminence maybe not being moving towards a resultant sort of um, arrival, but imminence and also imminence not just being about disorientation, but imminence being a quality of moving towards the transhuman, the metahuman, um, the animal, uh, because the human as a register of thought does not serve us, has not served us. And in the case of black people and black thought has not actually even been an option. Um, I think there's just one more slide here. Sorry. Um, let me just jump ahead. Sorry. Um, slow down your eyes for a moment, please. Um, all right. Well, I can stop here with this quote from Stephanie Smallwood's work. Stephanie Smallwood is a historian who works on the Middle Passage and the condition that produced um, Black as the, the laboring object of capital, of Western capital. Uh, the idea here in this slide, Black and flesh is used to probe the limits to which it is possible to discipline the body without extinguishing the life within it. And, you know, this, this sort of concept, um, which is foundational to Afro-pessimist Afro thought, um, helps remind us that we do have around the planet in this kind of um, Black ways of being, we have actually access to strategies of not survival, but strategies of, and not even just, just replenishment, but strategies of of, of, of cooperative um, affiliation, let's say, um, to be alongside life and liveliness that is not necessarily bounded by the human or registered in terms of the human. We have access to ways to be that give us um, sort of strategies towards um, understanding alternatives to this, this, this category of the human that is not serving us. Um, here, if we think about transhumanism, as a kind of alternative to thinking about the human as the register of life and to follow some of the transhumanist thinking in publication, transhumanists seek the continuation of the evolution of intelligent life beyond the human and the human limitations by means of science and technology. And um, in this, this idea, this again is where my interest in transhumanism or metahuman is actually lining up with a curiosity of how black thought is moving right now in 2022 through Afro-pessimism, through Afrofuturism. And Martine, thank you for bringing that into our conversation already, like a kind of what else could there be-ness. It's of urgent implication to me as a black American to think about how African-Americans have been cited, ironically, in the transhuman. So if modern capital is produced through the invention of the Middle Passage and the slave trade, you know, the slave trade is actually foundational to the production of modern capital. And of course, modern capital becomes foundational to understanding the, the last few centuries of technological advance. 
that again make this idea of the necklacing the satellites uh, that share information maybe freely. I'm not sure it's quite so free and available as uh, Martine would um, offer for us, but I want to listen and think alongside you um, in that questioning. It's ironic that African Americans have been already cited in this space of human, not human, um, transhuman, metahuman, here but not legible, here but underneath somehow the, the possibilities of a kind of modern um, future forward life. So the ways that African American life being cited as this, and by cite, I mean S-I-T-E-D, being positioned, I'll say it that way, being positioned outside the human, um, but then obviously we might be able to share aspects of what we understand African American life to be. So it's not as though Black life doesn't exist, even as it's rendered in this space outside of what the human might be according to Western philosophy and according to Western capital. So Afro-pessimism builds often on the works of theorists like Fred Moten, of course, who has been very good referencing Sadia Hartman, thinking about how um, the object can speak back to capital. And that's Fred Moten's first sort of gambit against Mark or Marx or extending Marx can the object speak? And Moten says, yes, the object speaks, the object screams, the object makes art. And this is how we're so concerned with dance, which is, of course, my area of, of a special interest, and questions of ritual, questions of spirituality, and questions of something that's alongside and amid a human, but also willing to be beyond or distending of a human. Um, I'm thinking just two more small points. Those were kind of the first three areas I wanted to bring up for our conversation today. Um, I wanted to turn a bit to animism as I'm thinking about um, African ways of gathering and philosophical address on that continent in relationship to spiritual practice. Something I've noticed with graduate students I've been working with from the continent, either from Senegal, um, from Burkina Faso or other places, is about animism and how animism has become a way for um, people to think about how to share spiritual craft or spiritual practices. And animism is uh, essentially, in some ways, you know, as a Black American who doesn't practice maybe in the Condomble or in some of the the religious sort of organizations that are available to me as a Black American, but you know, I don't participate in those forms. There's a way that animism and its kind of um, insistence on a relationship to livingness um, can inspire us again to think towards a, a meta or a transhuman, towards a something else-ness that technology is definitely bringing more and more forward to us. At the same time, I'm curious about how animism becomes a kind of um, religious uh, uh, you know, not just ontology or ideology, but doctrine. Like it, it actually gathers people in a certain kind of way that excludes others. So I'm curious about this, this rise of animism, especially among artists from the continent who are now working and living in the United States. So I wanted to highlight that in our conversation, even as I am super curious about animism as a way to understand a kind of affinity with other forms of life and liveliness that are circulating. Um, and the artists who are working in animism are always concerned with ritual. And that turns me to a kind of last point I'd like to raise for us to tussle with. Um, the ritual of performance or dance and animism brings ritual right into the, the center of the stage, literally, if you will, or the performance experience. We're seeing rituals engaged and um, artists, especially from the continent, um, are Bringing, their, bringing ritual practices into theatrical spaces and experimental theater making to kind of get outside of this category of human performance and towards a something else-ness. And so this helps me wonder about the rituals of the machine. What is the ritual of the transhuman? So as we're turning towards, um, you know, think practices we might call African practices of animism, if you will, and I don't like to use the word African even. I just think the continent is way too diverse and huge to kind of uh, fall into that tininess of being a single word, African. At the same time, I understand how it helps us move some thinking among each other. 
So this idea of a kind of uh, practice of ritual as a way to consecrate relationship, I'm wondering towards the rituals of the machine, the rituals of the technology, how does AI understand itself in relationship to ritual? And we see some of this as we do our, um, as we do our captures and the machines train us and they learn what we think is, looks like a bicycle or what we think looks like a crosswalk. Uh, in the context of the United States, these captures are very common and they're ways for us to um, have to help feed um, an AI model with information about how we, uh, you know, clicking through as humans, I guess, in relationship to the AI, understand things to be defined. I'm trying to think about what are these rituals of AI or the rituals of the machine and how can they help us sort of question our own rituals around our relationships to technology, if that word is even useful, but our relationships to um, how we're moving into transhuman space or metahuman space. So as we understand Ubuntu to be a kind of practice of ritual relationship or relationality, what are our relationships to even um, um, live processing, to internet, um, uh, Zoom calls or StreamYard or YouTube? How are those rituals, not just the ones that we make in relationship to gathering through a call on a Saturday that's one time in Rome and a different time where I'm broadcasting from in the United States, in the state of Florida, what's called Florida, but not just the rituals that we have as humans, what are the rituals of the machines and, and the AI modeling in relationship to our convergencing? How are the very um, helpful, useful, and complex ritual practices that performers engage all over the continent of Africa, if you will, in many different formations, you know, infinite numbers of performance practices and those rituals that define political dancing in Malawi or that define Sabar in Senegal, how are the rituals that produce forms of knowledge among people as a sharing and reciprocity, how are those rituals or what are the ritualistic kind of uh, manners of being that machine learning, AI, and um, um, technology writ large are producing. So I'm curious about this. I hope that this can become part of our conversation as we think about what the continent and black thought and African thought has to bring to bear on transhumanism and uh, metahumanism. I'm thrilled to share these, these incomplete thoughts with you. And I just wanna end by um, lifting up AI for Africa. This is the last thing. Um, we were thinking about practical sort of outcomes or practical work. And um, I have been a part of the AI for Africa um, array uh, for uh, since it began. I'm sorry, I can't find the, the web page quite easily. It's AI for Africa. It's a terrific um, array of researchers working in artificial intelligence and African thought. So I just want to lift that up into our conversation as well. Thank you so much. Wonderful to see you, Thomas. Great. Finally, again, after quite a few years, great that you're with us. And thanks a lot for that wonderful talk. We've just been talking just before getting ready for the event, actually, with 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 Leo and Chokwu. We've been talking about Ubuntu and the possibility of Ubuntu Plus or Trans Ubuntu. Um, so that will be a further issue, I guess, later on. No, Leo, do you directly want to... <laughs> Hi. Hi, Thomas, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, yes, uh, I mean, we're, we have been having that discussion, um, you know, before we started about Ubuntu, and um, and yes, my colleague is talking about Ubuntu Plus, and I'm talking about Trans Ubuntu. But one thing I, I am, you know, I'm so fascinated about is the issue of diversity and plurality. And also, thank you for creating this impression because. Um, or it's not a one thing, it's not a one dimensional thing. There's so many people and we can't just empty the thoughts of millions of people into just one narrative. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, the whole place is bubbling with diversity, with plurality. And you mentioned something I also found uh, fascinating. I think it was in, in reference to Jackson about black thoughts at plasticity. 
you know, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if, if you yeah. got me correctly. Yeah, yes. and I was and I was wondering um, in the in, in the light of the influence of emerging technology, in the light of the the, the, the trans, you know, in transhumanism, do you think we're gonna have a, a transcend? You know, we're gonna we're, we're gonna transcend this idea of blackness, whiteness categories in trying to express things, and uh, we you know it becomes outdated at some point. Yes, you know, this is such a great question, obviously, and we all tussle with it. I mean, I often um, think that the goal of Afro-pessimism, Afro-futurism, Black thought is that it obliterates itself, you know. So, you know, I know there are transhumanists and metahumanists who also think, you know, maybe an outcome is to move beyond the human as a register for understanding life. Um, at the same time, there are aspects of Black creativity, Black love, if you will, that you know, we'll never leave, they're here now. It's like capital. Will we ever be outside of capital or power? I don't know, probably not. So I think maybe we move beyond the parts of this thinking that constrains us and, 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 and allows us to be hateful, if you will, and we move towards the parts that allow us to express different aspects of possibility. Again, human, non-human, beyond human, technological, because there are ways that black people use technology that are really different than the ways that white Western or Eurocentric, you know, sort of thinking about what technology is or can do. And, you know, that difference is gonna help us build something much stronger because we have different ways to relate to even a laptop or a, a, an iPhone. And it's, 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 it's such a strong part of sort of in particular Western culture, sort yeah. of the binaries going back Plato's cave, it yes. was the pride sun, which is the good and unchanging, and it's a dark cave, yes. which is the bad, which is which is where sort of you know everything uh, and it's 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 a clear evaluation what is the good and what is the bad, and it, it's got that's the basis of like uh, racism embedded in in, in Western culture, sure. and so it's it's quite a firm encrusted structure, and that what also makes it quite difficult and challenging you not know, to overcome. But it has revolutionary consequences. Um, but that's exactly one of the implications. You now, what you know, transhumanism, matter humanism is all all moving moving up against. No. Hey, to, well, uh, <laughs> yes. This is why we gather. This is how we wonder together. And yes. So today in these little comments, I just wanted to offer some ways of black thought and Afro-pessimism as again, a kind of pivot towards where we're trying to go. Um, we have a question on YouTube from um, Andre Jacobs. Uh, it, it says, would that not make black people and black thought exohuman? Too? Yeah, exactly. That's great. And you know, this is how Afro-pessimism works. So it defines an exohuman in order to, um, well, you know, the, the ambition of Afro-pessimist thought is always a bit nihilistic. So that's a challenge. <laughs> and that's something that though in the meta-human and the, the trans-human space, we also wonder at, like we're not nihilist, but what are we, you know, what happens to the human as we've known it? If it's not useful anymore, what is useful? And how do we, how do we understand value inside these formations? But yeah, I would just kind of agree with that assertion. So yeah, that's exactly the point. So yes, and then what? And maybe that's Leo's point, and maybe that's the next presenter because. And then what? <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, time is passing so quickly. It's been great to have you with us. Hopefully, we'll that's meet up. You've been here in Rome. Hopefully, you'll be back here again at I John Cabot University it. again. It's been wonderful that you've been here with us. Have a wonderful day. Um, and Betsy, yes, we're off to presenting our next speaker. Thanks. Yep, thank you, Professor, Professor de France. Um, I'll be introducing our next speaker, who will be um, Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Um, I'll give a quick introduction and then he'll be joining us. So um, Dr. Aubrey de Grey is a biomedical gerontologist and he's based in California and uh, he received his BA in computer science and has his PhD in biology from the University of Cambridge. Um, his research interests encompass the characterization of all types of self-inflicted cellular and molecular damage um, that constitute mam mammalian aging and the design of interventions um, to repair or like obviate that image. 
Um, Dr. Gray is a fellow of um, for both the Gerontological Society of America and the American Aging Association, and he sits on the editorial and scientific advisory boards of numerous journals and organizations. Um, he is also a highly sought after speaker, so we are very grateful to have him here with us today. Um, and he has been invited to speak and talk at different scientific conferences and universities and companies, um, ranging from uh, pharma to life insurance and also to the public. Um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Aubrey, for joining us today. <laughs> you? Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, I think I'm on, uh, I'm live now. Yeah, marvelous. Okay, hello, everybody. Um, and thank you so much for having me. I must say I've really enjoyed the first two uh, presentations over the past hour. Um, and I have decided not to use slides today uh, for a couple of reasons, actually. First reason was a technical one that I've actually migrated to a new computer since I did the test stuff with Betsy um, a week or three ago. And so I didn't want to take any risks. Um, but, <clears throat> but the more practical one is that... Um, of course, I am a biologist. I, I have actually you know, very much been reminded over the past hour of uh, how little I really know about transhumanism. Some of the, um, you know, the words that have been used by Martin and Thomas um, to describe certain concepts are actually words I'd never heard before, um, despite the fact that I was actually the inaugural recipient of the H.G. Wells Award for contributions to transhumanism uh, uh, that the World Transhumanist Association created in probably 2004 or something like that. Um, uh, so yeah, I think I'd actually like to start there. And I, um, I guess I apologize in advance for the fact that um, my remarks are probably going to be a bit disjointed. Uh, I, I just have a lot of thoughts about transhumanism in Africa that honestly, I think they are disjointed, you know, the, the, the concepts that we need to be speaking about have not really had the opportunity, either in my own mind, or perhaps in the wider world to, um, uh, to gravitate to a coherent framework of thinking. And I think that's fine. Um, so, um, first of all, a little bit about myself, um, as a kind of um, a bit of a subjective monologue, I think, um, it's important for everybody to know people who don't people here who don't know me to understand that I'm really a you know I'm I'm definitely not a philosopher, I'm a, an engineer really I'm a technologist, um, so I'm, perhaps I would call myself a techno visionary, a pioneering technologist, um, and this means that I think about uh, I guess well philosophical concepts more in terms of their practical definitions than their formal definitions. So um, if we use the example of artificial intelligence, which is the field that I worked in before I became a biologist, um, there, you know, there are various ways to define it formally. But for me, the, the, the definition that I think of, and I think, I think about, is a practical one, a shifting one that says basically artificial intelligence is the range of things that humans are still better at than computers are. So, um, of course, that changes as time goes on and as computers get better at different things. I think about um, transhumanism in rather the same way, really. I think about it in terms of the activities that it encompasses. And so for myself, I think of myself as simply a medical researcher. Uh, you know, I'm interested in addressing the world's number one medical problem. And, um, you know, that kind of... That sounds very down to earth and, you know, uh, perhaps a little bit too pedestrian for some people. Um, uh, but I don't object to being, you know, to transhumanists, um, you know, thinking of me as one of their own, because to me, everyone who works in transhumanism in any capacity is working for the same techno visionary goal to maximize the benefit to the human condition that can be achieved by technological progress of one sort or another. And um, I guess this is the first opportunity I have to bring Africa into what I wanted to say, um, because I still remember vividly, uh, I think it was around 2016, um, seeing the latest update of the um, table of 
life expectancy in different countries from the World Health Organization and observing that there wasn't a single country on the list that had a life expectancy lower than 50 anymore. That was the first year in which that became true. Now, of course, the countries that were at the, at the shortest life expectancy were overwhelmingly those in sub-Saharan Africa. But, of course, the important thing was that they're catching up. I mean, catching up really fast. And, of course, that's fantastic. It was, um, you know, a real eye-opener to me. I think, you know, as, as was mentioned by Betsy in the introduction, um, I give a lot of talks to the general public. And there is a perception out there, which I've got to say I initially shared, that aging is a first world problem, that it's something that is by far the biggest uh, cause of sickness and death in the industrialized world. But, you know, the fact is, you know, the numbers don't lie, that aging is now the number one medical problem in every part of the world, including sub-Saharan Africa. And as such, you know, this kind of, um, well, I guess, first of all, it, uh, it, it, it's a unity thing. You know, it brings uh, a, a greater degree of commonality of, of, you know, shared goals and shared challenges between um, different parts of the world. And I think that's always a good thing. Um, I was I was definitely um, uh, tickled when uh, Martin started talking about uh, started, started using uh, the acronym Jedi to mean um, a few things. My first thought was just end death immediately. Um, uh, but um, in terms of the point I'm making here, the continued increase of life expectancy in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa especially is, of course, a consequence of increased development of and especially increased access to medicines that prevent death at early ages, just the same as what happened in the industrialized world a long time ago now. And as such, um, I think the um, time is now when Africans can begin to speak, I don't know, as equals, shall we say, um, to uh, Western uh, thinkers and, of course, medical researchers uh, in a conversation that leads to unity, uh, to, that leads to diversity and inclusiveness and equity, of course, and justice, just as Martin was saying um, an hour ago. So, um, you know, we, we need to be, I think, highlighting and promoting that fact uh, a lot. I remember... Uh, after I saw that statistic six or so years ago, uh, using it a lot in my talks. And I am uh, always struck by how shocked and surprised people are when they discover that aging has become the number one problem in terms of health uh, for Africa as well as for the rest of the world. Um, now, in terms of uh, the role of longevity, which is, of course, what I work on, in the wider transhumanist agenda and the wider um, transhumanist agenda in Africa, I think the main thing I want to say is that the diversity and, of course, uniqueness of culture in Africa is just as important, in fact, possibly even more important than the diversity that we see in the rest of the world. There's just so much of it. The, um, you know, it, it's like, I mean, I've, I, I have to confess that I've only ever been to one country in Africa, which is South Africa. Um, but even from a distance, it's, you know, blindingly obvious that the diversity of culture in Africa is just breathtaking. And of course, diversity of ways of thinking is, if, if anything, the single most um, important pillar of technological progress. Anyone who works in pioneering technology understands that the difficult part is thinking out of the box, uh, escaping from the, um, conven the, the conventional thinking, the conventional wisdom, so to speak, uh, that is, so, is at such risk of holding the world back. And diversity of uh, upbringing and of, 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 you know, of, of thinking, of ways of thinking, 
is the main ingredient that helps to solve and um, uh, minimize the damage done by conventional wisdom. I speak again somewhat personally here in that, I, as Betsy mentioned at the beginning, I switched fields uh, in about um, my early 30s. I had uh, originally a training in computer science and I worked in artificial intelligence research for several years. A large part of why I chose to switch fields and felt that I had some chance of making a contribution to the crusade against aging was that I was aware of the, um, uh, the, the, the history, the distinguished history of um, people who switch fields. Uh, the fact that there are many examples where people have switched fields and made significant contributions in their new field uh, rather rapidly, simply by not being encumbered by the conventional wisdom of people who were in that field since they, um, since they began. Um, the most conspicuous example, of course, is that in the 1950s, the whole of molecular biology was invented by a bunch of physicists. Um, so, you know, that's why I thought, you know, maybe by bringing a different way of thinking to the field, I might be able to make a difference. And um, so it turned out to be. Uh, I think, yeah, so, so this is the same thing, I feel, that there is, you know, I will be astonished if we look back 50 years from now and we do not see that people coming into this field from Africa and bringing their you know, uniquely African way of thinking. Um, and of course, I hear I'm uh, not meaning to say that there's only one African way of thinking, precisely, uh, precisely the opposite, there's so many. Um, but their unique way of thinking into the, um, uh, into the conversation and into the effort uh, will, will, will have made an enormous contribution to that effort and to hastening the... Um, the defeat of aging, and thus, of course, you know, alleviating incalculable amounts of suffering and saving incalculable numbers of lives. Um, and I feel that now is the time when Africans, especially young Africans, can be told this message, can be, you know, can be um, inspired to think in terms of the um, the ways in which they can aim high and. Uh, aspire to making such contributions. Of course, I do not want to limit that concept to the um, the crusade against aging. This applies across the whole of transhumanism, across the whole of pioneering technology. So uh, the fact that this conference is uh, focused on Africa, but it's being run by uh, someone who's at a university in Italy, uh, you know, that's uh, you know that's a statement in and of itself. Um, and so, Stefan, I want to, again, uh, compliment and congratulate you for the initiative to put this on. Um, I see that there's quite a lot of questions coming along in the chat already, so I'm not going to um, limit the amount of time I uh, am leaving for questions. I'm probably going to only talk for another couple of minutes. Um, uh, as I said, I want this to be a conversation because transhumanism is an area where I do not feel that I have any right to give a lecture, really. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I just want to say that um, the diversity of speakers here, and of course, I've noticed that um, Bent um, uh, Kleiner Gunk is later on the program, an hour or so from now. So um, I imagine that Bent will be talking about anti-aging medicine as it uh, currently exists, uh, whereas I, of course, I am very much a PhD rather than MD. So I am uh, focused in my own work on the development of medicines that don't yet exist. Um, uh, but uh, of course, from the point of view of anyone in the wider world who is interested in not getting sick when they get old, uh, both of these things are extremely um, important. And so, you know, the fact that there are two longevity uh, scientists on this short, relatively short program of the conference is, I think, appropriate. I think it is a um, you know, a strong statement that aging remains the world's biggest problem, the thing that causes most death and most suffering. And we can look forward to the day when it is not the world's most important problem. And we can focus on other things that will take humanity, whether in Africa or elsewhere, even further towards um, even greater goals in terms of the human condition and our diversity and indeed our uh, um, inclusiveness. So yeah, I think I'll just stop there and I will answer any questions that you may want.
Thank you. Oh, amazing! Thanks a lot for having you. It's it's it, it's enormous pleasure just having you here with us, and and your jetty as just and death immediately has already been taken on, and you've created. A, <laughs> um, it's a strong created a strong resonance in the audience. Um, yeah, further comments, Aubrey, the best, and yeah, because you've actually made, you know, really us. Many people rethink the meaning of aging, realizing aging as a disease, realizing the seven processes which which are accompanied with aging, and this is uh, disease problems which need to be tackled, and that thereby we could radically expect our, our life life expectancy, and and this is this is really I think this is the most most important also concerning innovation technological innovation I, I think the most important industry which is currently happening. Um, so thanks a lot, uh, and I, I, yeah, we've got loads of questions as well. So, <laughs> yeah, um, we question on, um, from Andre Jacobs on YouTube. Um, it reads, "Do do you think that extending human life, in a sense, the ultimate virtual enhancement, and therefore the ultimate transhuman endeavor?" Uh, the answer is simply yes. I do. I do think that. I think that. Um... You know, this, this is kind of why, even though I would not never call myself a transhumanist, uh, because I think of myself as an engineer or a technologist, uh, nevertheless, I don't object to other people uh, calling me that. I, I, I guess, well, I certainly don't object to transhumanists calling me a transhumanist. I think it's, uh, you know, I, I, because I do a lot of public interface, I definitely find that I have to be very careful with words when I talk to the general public. You know, I don't like to call aging a disease, for example. I call it a medical problem because if you call it a disease, you get um, a, uh, you know, a, a, there's a whole bunch of baggage around that that says, you know, maybe it can be cured, um, which is not the, way, not the way to think about it. Things like that. So, um, you know, I think the word transhumanism, just like any word, especially any long word, <laughs> um, um, has, has, you know, connotations in the wider world. But with this audience, the people who actually identify as transhumanists, I don't have a problem at all. I think that, Andre, you're absolutely right. The, um, and certainly as of now, extending human life or in particular extending human health and with extending human life as a side effect of that um, is absolutely the ultimate enhancement. Um, except I would probably not want to use the word ultimate either, because as I was mentioning a few minutes ago, um, once we've done it, there's going to be other enhancements that uh, we're definitely going to want to do as well. And so there will be another one. Yeah, um, thank you for answering that question. We also have another question from G. Stolyarov, and it reads, um, could cultivating interest in longevity research among Africans be one key to overcoming the, cutter, the current bottleneck of research talent in the field? And if so, how can this be done soon? Yeah, this is an absolutely excellent question. Uh, thank you, Gennady. Um, so first of all, let me, uh, let me unpack the question a little bit. Um, those of you who don't follow the longevity field closely may not be aware of what a completely transformative year 2021 was. Uh, in 2021, an insane amount of money entered the field. Um, and here I do not simply mean the private sector, because, of course, that certainly has been taking off for maybe the past five years or so with the, uh, the whole, um, uh, uh, well, with, with investors, seed investors, angel investors, and indeed venture capitalists and so on uh, being involved in funding startup companies uh, in like enormous numbers. That's been happening for maybe five years. But last year, um, really the, the cryptocurrency, the, the blockchain community started getting very heavily involved. There were a number of very large, you know, eight-digit donations to various um, nonprofits in the longevity research area, uh, which is of course vital. The um, private sector is very, very important, but it inevitably focuses very strongly on the low-hanging fruit, on the things that can make money reasonably soon, um, and the things that are more difficult and further away from making money are just as important for the overall crusade. So, uh, you know, my foundation, Sense Research Foundation, has spent its entire existence essentially struggling to stay afloat um, because of lack of financial support from 
from the wider world. And of course, we're insanely grateful for the financial support that did get us through that decade. But it'll be quite a while before we're struggling to survive again, because last year we received a very, very large um, uh, amount of money, and that was mostly from the crypto world. And, uh, you know, so this means that, uh, coming back to the original question from Gennady, um, that money is no longer the rate limiter. For, uh, for the longest time, I was going out there saying that we could probably speed up the, um, the, 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 the process of getting to what I call longevity escape velocity by maybe a factor of as much as three uh, just by money, uh, just, by, just by being better funded and having, um, being able to go faster as a result. No, it's not the money, but there's a new bottleneck, which is talent. The, it's just, and I would say, you know, this, this is something I'm, I, I feel like I have to be slightly partly responsible for, because I obviously am a high profile uh, public speaker in this area. You know, I don't seem to have done as good enough job to bring youngsters into this field as researchers, as people who want to work on the longevity crusade as, uh, in, at the bench. And you know, right now we are really struggling to recruit the right talent. So I think Gennady, yeah, I mean, the more we get the word out in Africa, of course, not just in Africa, but the whole world, but the more we get the word out, the better. And in terms of how we can do it soon, I don't have any magic bullets there. I don't, um, I don't know enough about the way people from, I mean, students from Africa get to make their choices. Uh, to be able to answer that question but those of you here who do know that kind of thing absolutely if you want to make a real difference to the uh, speed at which we defeat aging then now would be the time to get out into the african schools and universities and get people to make the choice to work on uh, research areas that are relevant to longevity <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we also have another question, um, also from YouTube, uh, from Dan Elton. And it reads, are there ways in which technologies such as gene therapy and medical AI systems will be easier to deploy in Africa? Um, I'm thinking of how Liz Parrish had to travel outside of the United States, not only to deploy, but develop and run trials. Yeah, this is, this is, so this is a fantastic question. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the one of the in, most enormous problems that exist in the West in terms of progress in medicine is over caution. It's been established for a very long time that the number of people who die as a result of the long time that it takes to approve a therapy in the West uh, is vastly greater than the number of people who die as a result of um, therapies that, are, that have side effects being approved. Um, far greater. And, you know, we need to kind of go, move with the times here. Of course, the concept here dates back to Hippocrates, the idea of first do no harm. And honestly, it's out of date. I wrote an editorial in my journal probably 15 years ago called um, Hippocrates Has Had His Day, um, <clears throat> which basically made this point that, you know, even though for sure medicine is still a big black box and you know we are essentially groping in the dark when we develop medical uh, advances nevertheless the amount that we know about what's going to happen and what to do about things that were not expect that were unexpected you know is so much greater than it was even a century ago that um you know we should be thinking in a more um probabilistic way we should be Way we should be quantifying risk, risk and reward much more um, carefully than we currently do. And um, so really, I think Dan's question is very opposite here because um, the um, situation should be easier outside of, especially outside of the industrialized world. And so, I mean, I think um, as, as Dan mentioned, uh, Liz Parrish, uh, my great friend who, uh, has been a pioneer in the gene therapy world, um, went to Latin America for this. Uh, same kind of thing applies, you know, uh, regulations are less, uh, uh, are less stringent, more relaxed. Um, now, of course, there is a downside to this. We have to ask, why are they more relaxed in some places than others? And this goes beyond medicine, actually. It seems to me that 
a lot of the um, different differences that we see across the world between different countries in terms of regulations um, relate to the perception of the value of life. In other words, um, you know, the, the longer people live and the health, the, the higher their quality of life, um, the more um, I guess possessive they are about it, the, 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 the less willing they are to take risks or to allow their citizens to take risks in the case of um, policymakers and lawmakers. Um, and so, for example, if, if we look within the USA, uh, societies that, are, that have a lower life expectancy, and that often means Afro-Americans, of course, um, uh, tend also to have... Um, greater amounts of violence among, among you know, young men, for example. Uh, there tends to be uh, a bit of a correlation there that's always you know, concerned me and, and troubled me that um, you know, perception of the value of life can overshoot, if you like, and cause overly, um, uh, uh, overly cautious behaviour. Um, so yes, I think, I think absolutely, Dan, um, th there is the opportunity here for um, for Africans who have not been caught in that trap yet to, um, and here I mean African countries as opposed to African individuals, uh, to, um, uh, to, to play, a, play a big part in allowing uh, medicines to be developed and disseminated more rapidly. Thank you. Um, I think we have one last question. Uh, it reads, if we call aging a medical problem and not a disease, how should we um, then refer to it in terms of fixing the problem if we don't use the word cure? Yeah, great. So I, I, that, again, again, very good question. Um, I would say that the opportunity that not using the word disease and also not using the word cure gives us is to uh, ram home the analogy, which I believe is an extremely accurate analogy, even, uh, but, but often is not thought to be, between the human body and a man-made machine, like a car or an aeroplane or whatever. I always make the point, as strongly as I can, that the um, idea of some kind of natural limit to longevity arises from simply um, not thinking of the body as a machine. Because we know perfectly well that even though machines have warranty periods, um, nevertheless, those warranty periods can be transcended uh, you know, in, uh, arbitrarily far, um, as, in, as with, for example, vintage cars that are more than 100 years old, uh, simply by preventative maintenance, by doing the right kinds of, um, uh, uh, well, I mean, that's the word, preventative maintenance, repair of damage before it has become symptomatic, before the doors fall off or, or whatever. A lot of people say, yeah, that's, that's a nice, you know, that's a nice, um, you know, simplistic analogy, but ultimately it's nonsense really, isn't it? Because the body is so much more complicated and it, you know, it repairs itself and so on. And I have to point out that these are not reasons why the analogy is wrong. You know, the fact that it's more complicated is simply a difference of degree. And the fact that the body has such an enormously impressive arsenal of uh, automatic built-in self-repair systems is a good thing. It, mean, it means that our problem is easier because all we have to do is fill in the gaps in, our, in what, we're, what we're born with. Um, so yeah, I, I, I believe that the right way to talk, to, to get back directly to the question, the right way to talk about um, addressing aging with medicine is to talk about preventative maintenance. There's so many further questions I would love to ask right now, but we're already, time is flying. In particular, concerning the interaction of AI and 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 sort of gene therapies, the possibilities, and that's now I, I've been to, I know Vitalik Buterin and Michael Craver with him I've been together actually a couple of months ago, and so there's quite an interest in sort of the digital world investing now also in 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 as you as you mentioned before, so that's that's an issue. Maybe in the future we can get you here to John Cabot University in Rome sometime. We can arrange something. It's been wonderful having having had you with us here today so thanks thank a, thanks a lot yeah thank you and now betsy are you um presenting our next speaker <laughs> no thank you thank you doctor um Rai will be presenting our next speaker perfect right 
Yes. So now we will be presenting uh, Mr. Abugele Omoele. He is a researcher on engineering technology such as AI and biotechnology. He currently consults on the ethics of AI and data science for corporate organizations. So, Mr. Omoele. Uh, I hope it's all working. Hello. Hello, everyone. Ah, good so, to um, have you with us. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, first, um, I'd like to say a very big thank you to Professor Stefan Lorenz Sogna and um, Leo Igwe and Vai and every other person who is part of the organizing committee to put together this awesome virtual conference just a, just a brief because your camera is not turned on i don't know maybe um because we can't see you right now so, but maybe um, you can turn on the I camera if to be possible on the topic yeah i actually want to um, share share my screen so um i have a presentation yeah uh, just a moment but we can have if uh, we can have the presentation and 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 the camera actually and the video of you at the same time if if you want to do so yeah okay i'll um, uh, uh, try to figure out uh, so i'm putting up my presentation in just a moment Just a moment. Yeah, sure. And in the meantime, yeah, there's still loads of loads of comments uh, in uh, in in the commentary section uh, for a previous uh, speaker. Okay. Just mentioning here some examples. <laughs> okay. And. Okay. So if we've got yes, I can. All right. So um, you can enlarge, um, sort of go full. Okay. Was very maybe maybe he was disconnected because he suddenly vanished from the stream. Um, oh no, he's back. By the way, um, um, now now he's back. There was a brief disconnection. Um, are you? Yeah, I'm back. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, sure, sure, sure. And please feel too free to ask the questions already during the presentation. So I will I will remove myself from the stream now, so that the floor is all yours. Okay, so uh, I'll be speaking on the topic of the impact of religion on radical science in Africa, and just uh, a little bit about me, uh, just to be sure that you can hear me. So, uh, can I get a feedback if someone is hearing me? Yes, we can. Okay, all right. So, yeah, so a little bit about me. I'm a Christian. I'm a Nigerian. And 
I'm an African, so uh, it would expect a little bit of bias uh, towards Christianity. So just if it turns out that if if um, you know, it's just one of those things actually. Um, so for the past ten years, I've been researching on the intersection of religion and science, and from 2018 to 2019, I was privileged to serve as vice chairman of the Christian Transhumanist Association. And in 2020, I was guest editor by the American Scientific Affiliation on a research paper bordered on um, the session of religion and science. Actually, it focused more on Christian faith and science. So just to uh, give some background, um, I'd like to just give a simple definition of transhumanism, transhumanism that's going to fit my presentation. So um, I'm sticking to the definition by Max Moore, where he defined transhumanism as a class of philosophies of life that seek the continuation and acceleration of the evolution of intelligent life beyond its current human form and human limitations by means of science and technology guided by life promote, promoting principles and values. And um, in one phrase, I'm going to call or refer to transhumanism as human, human enhancement. Uh, but, but my focus more, I'll be focusing more on radical science and um, transhumanism is just um, one of that. So I uh, briefly want to talk about what we know about Africa, religion and science. Uh, it's interesting to know um, that lots of Africans uh, either Christians or Muslim, and Sub-Saharan Africa, where I come from, is a deeply pious region where a majority is conservative. Um, so, and then there are other statistics there, but the key is that lots of Africans are either Christians or Muslim. And I believe that, of course, if you have um, a population that is full of Christians and Muslims um, and religious people, then it's going to shape how they respond to technology, how they embrace technology, and how they leverage technology in their daily lives. So in my next slide, talking about Afghan's view of human enhancement and radical science. So, um, okay, I just tried to like uh, reach some kind of conclusions in some ways about how we can begin to look at how we can, as we talk about transhumanism, metahumanism, radical science, cryonics, immortality, and all of that. So, uh, according to research, we know that most Africans are religious. And we know that most religions are conservative about leveraging radical science. Therefore, we can conclude that Africans are conservative about radical science. So in my next slide, talking about the relationship between religion and science. Um, just to be sure, um, uh, I just want to probably get a feedback from um, someone to be sure that everyone is hearing me. Hello? Yes, yes, you're good. Uh, please keep on going. Okay, all right. Yes. So, okay. So, according to a researcher by the name Stemark, in 2004, he classified the relationship between religion and science into three main groups. And the first is the independence view, which states that there's no overlap between science and religion. And then we have 
the contact view that says that uh, there's some form of overlap between the fields and then a third view that focuses on the union of the domains of science and religion so then what's my observation in my uh, 10 years of studying about how to reconcile religion and science of course i'm a christian i'm religious and um, i embrace technology ai transhumanism and all of that so but in my 10 years of trying to see how we could reconcile both fields uh, i <laughs> i observed some things and the conclusion i got to is that the most important thing to focus on when you talk about the intersection of radical science or transhumanism and religion is just the common ground because there are lots of areas where uh, religious people will disagree with scientists and scientists will disagree with religious people but the truth is there are some common grounds you know that appeal to um, both sides of the coin and i believe that that's just the key to balancing um, the balancing the equation, so to speak. And uh, just for the context of this presentation, I'd really like to talk about uh, um, one of the common grounds, you know, is about uh, what we call spirituality in the African context, you know, um, and then applying logic to that all right so now i observe that most supernatural or spiritual occurrences have logical undertones there are some logic behind them but before you get to the point where where you could um explain the logic it looks like oh this is spiritual because we just don't know it we don't understand it so i'll be giving some examples real quick so and then first is this concept of abiku. Abiku is a Yoruba word, and Yoruba is one of the major languages in Nigeria, actually. And abiku means someone who was born but destined to die. Another I mean another tribe in Nigeria, the Hebrews, they call them Ogbanjis, you know, and it's just still the same view that these children are destined to be lazy and um, they will eventually die and then they will be born repeatedly so uh, it kind of believe oh, this person will die then will come back then dies again and come back now around that time at some point in history they were killing them so you just look at someone and say okay this place is of banji or it's a biku so what do you just do you just kill them this person is going to die anyway so we just kill them so that you don't come back you know but as we progress in science and research we found out that what the yugobas were calling abiku and what the Igbos in nigeria are calling Ogbanji are just people who have sickle cell anemia you know uh sickle cell and of course we know that uh, okay yes of course we know all of that that sickle cell is caused by uh, a disease that is a result of two genes that inherited one from the mother and one from the father. Now, before the enlightenment of sickle cell anemia, Abiku was ascribed supernatural uh, powers or a supernatural event. But in Nigeria today, it's a different ball game, it's a different thing. And even in some African countries, because we've been able to look at it logically. And now we understand the logic and we'll be able to solve that problem to a very large extent. So now in Nigeria and some other African countries where they have even killed people in the name of this thing called Abiku or Banjis, they now go for um, blood tests before marriage and you know that's helped to solve the problem a little bit. Then another Another thing I'll talk about, you know, um, about some supernatural events 
having logical undertones is about some things I've heard in my conversation with some religious people about insecurity in Nigeria. So I've cited this example uh, because it's something that is a little bit recent in Nigeria and I don't in any way, um, I'm not supporting insecurity, I'm not in support of war and all of that. So um, I had a discussion with um, some religious leaders about Israel in relation to their military strength and how they have been able to solve some problems in their countries by leveraging technology. But from the discussions, you know, I was able to um, to understand how to think about the Israeli technology. Okay, so one of the leaders told me that Israel has superpowers, and that's why it is very, very difficult to defeat Israel. And then someone else told me um, in Israel, if we go to Israel, there's the cloth that, that they used to cover the face of Jesus is there. So on that basis, you cannot defeat Israel. And someone said, uh, the spear that was used to pierce the skin of Jesus is in Israel. And because it's there, you cannot defeat Israel. Now, I'm saying all of this to uh, give some context um, as to how some people think about science you know how it is possible to ascribe some supernatural powers to just things that are very logical you know um but i try to educate them that that's part of the reasons why israel is uh, you know very successful um in terms of their military strength is their ability to leverage technology and i try to explain to them the iron doom which is this artificial intelligence All right, so because um, you all know that, you know, with the Iron Dome, the Israelis have been able to take care of the IS space, you know, and they have all the facts there, 3,000 rocket fired towards the Israelis, they'll be able to, like, uh, accept about 90% of them and all of that just by leveraging advanced technologies, you know. And then, next slide, how do we connect the dots between religion and radical science. Of course, I'm just trying to re reiterate that, that the, probably the best way to connect the dots between religion and science is by focusing on common ground. And when we choose to focus on common ground, then we have probably a question, which is um, from a conservative religious point of view, how far is too far? So if religious people are conservative, are conservative then when you talk about radical science you're talking about deep science you know uh thinking outside the box outside the box like Abu the great said in his presentation and then there's this also there's also this cultural thing you know about africans you know which makes them very conservative so that problem of uh, being conservative in relation to technologies of technology and all of that is something that has to be addressed and um, one of the solutions to that, I believe, is by empowering people to have the option to either opt in or opt out. So it means that nobody is forced to leverage any advanced technology. You can choose to use the technology or not. You know, now that doesn't solve all the problem, but it's just like uh, a piece in the puzzle, so to speak. And so, in conclusion, I'm running off now. Uh, Yes, yeah, so I'll talk about immortality um, as one of the common ground. Of course, we know that in most religion, immortality is a common thing. And even in the Bible, the Christian Bible, um, Methuselah in the Bible lived more than 900 years. Um, in Psalm, the Bible says, uh, the 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 lifespan of a man is numbered and it's about 70 years so to speak and in the new testament in Corita it says death has been defeated then the 
uh, mortality we put on immortality so immortality is a key theme even in the bible and perhaps in probably every other religion in africa so it's one of those common grounds that we could uh, look at and focus on to get people excited about radical science and all of that and um even in immortality some transhumanists do not want to live for a very long they don't want to, they don't want to live for a very 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 long time some people don't find the idea of living up to like a thousand years interesting all right so um it makes a lot of sense first to like focus on the on the common ground as regards um radical science when you talk about religious people and to also give them the option to opt out so i cited uh, the research done by Enk, uh, who was the managing director at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies between uh, 2011 and 2012 in a survey he did for transhumanists. Now, he found out that of the 818 respondents, about 23.8% of them did not want immortality. And some of the reasons argued were boredom, as of a population, and desire to go to go to an afterlife whatever it is you know you know it's just like very ethical to provide people with options to opt in and opt out so in conclusion yes this is like just the main thing i want to talk about today religion and radical science are compatible when we focus on common grounds so that's the end of my presentation thank you for your time um, I thank you, organizers, for your time. Thank you, listeners, for your time. Yes, it's so important to address the issue of, of religion and sort of the transhumanist goals, expanding the health span. Um, that's what um, I've realized. I've been, I've talked to quite a few uh, Christians in debates and sort of always stressing um, that in the Bible, there are actually quite a few people who are, um, uh, uh, who are 120 years old. And so far, our life expectancy is only in the average 80 years, depending on. Um, and, and so we see, even if you argue on the basis of the Bible, there's a possibility to expand the life expectancy further to 120. And maybe even to, you know, Methuselah has even wider um, um, age range. So it, these are issues because uh, it, um, the various religions are, are so strong and there's some hesitation it's extremely important to address the issue so on, on that basis by reference to the bible it is always also possible to justify you know uh, an increased health span no and that's that's sort of you showed very clearly the relevance um that there doesn't have to be the conflict um between these two approaches right no yeah. you have got some questions Yes, yes, we do have some questions. Uh, one is from YouTube from Fabrizio Conti, and he is saying thank you for this interesting presentation. But his question is that within the relationship between religion and science in Africa, do magical traditions and beliefs still play a role? If so, which ones? Sorry, um, could you repeat that? I didn't get okay. it well. Sorry. Yes. Okay, so could we slow up, please? You know, yeah. Yes. Okay. He says, within the relationship between religion and science in Africa, do magical traditions and beliefs still play a role? If so, which ones? Yeah, wow, that's a big question. But I know there are lots of um, traditions and religions in Africa. And uh, I'm just, I'm a Christian, so... Um, I do not have experience, you know, in all of those religions. So, but I can say, yes, emphatically, yes, that, um, yes, magic and religiosity play a role in Africa, you know, in relation to transhumanism and science. Okay, interesting. Uh, we have another question from G. So, Yaro, Yaro, yes. Do you think that some of this African religion leaders' view of Israel's success are an example of Arthur Clark's third law. Any sufficiency advice technology is industrializably for magic. Okay, so you said, do I think um, that some of the African religious leaders' view of Israeli success is an example of 
Okay. Um, well, I think so. I think so because um, because you know, as I said, the 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 view here at times is that when you don't understand the modus operandi of a technology, they could just ascribe it some magical powers. You know, like in the in the case of Abiko that I cited, because they didn't know about this uh, sickle cell anemia, so they believed that it was supernatural, and so people were even killed at, at that time. You know, saying they were Abiku or Banjais, uh, you know, and that um, they don't want them to reincarnate, so they killed them instead of um, going deep down to logically look at the cause of the problem. So uh, the answer to that question is a yes. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Then I believe um, that would be the questions that we have currently for you. Yeah. And it's already uh, nearly seven o'clock, so um, we're running. The time is passing so so quickly. Thanks a lot um, for participating in this event. Um, and yes, now we can move on to our next uh, speaker. Rai, are you presenting? Bet Betsy will oh, be. Betsy is, is so we will. Yes, um, I'll be presenting our next speaker. Um, next we have Mr. Choku Abdul. Um, I'll, uh, as usual, I'll give a quick uh, introduction and then he'll be joining us. So, Mr. Choku is a Nigerian philosopher, futurist, and transhumanist with interests relating to transhumanism and issues of African development and civilization. Um, he's also a speaker, writer, and organizer on topics and areas relating to philosophy and also the movement of transhumanism. He is the founder of Transhumanists Africa, co-founder of the Enlightenment Transhumanist Forum of Nigeria, um, and member of Transhumanist Studies Group and H Plus Media um, Outreach and Advocacy Advisor um, at Humanity Plus. Uh, he's also an advisor and an, on the ed editorial board of um, Moralist Magazine, um, head of African Markets at Transdisciplinary Agora for Future, and the senior editor of that um, magazine as well. Um, he uh, is also one of the contributing authors of the Transhumanism Handbook, um, published by Springer Nature. And um, as a rising thought leader on transhumanism in Africa, he is particularly concerned about connecting um, his passion for transhumanist philosophy with the idea of an African enlightenment and the prospect of a fourth industrial, industrial revolution on the continent. Um, he's currently he, he currently lectures in uh, philosophy at Koji State University in Nigeria. And um, he, he also co coordinates a campus uh, philosophy club there. Thank you, Mr. Choku, for joining us. All right, thank you, Betsy, for that wonderful introduction. And um, thanks to the organizers, Leo Igwe and Stefan, for this great honor to be part of this seminar program. Uh, before I go into my um, little talk today, let me just uh, make it clear there that the idea of Ubuntu Plus, which we were discussing backstage, it's not what I'm here to talk about today. It's just something I'm playing with in my head. But um, if Leo and Stefan are quite interested, then we could uh, really make something systematic out of it. Yeah, so that's for Ubuntu Plus. Then uh, secondly, I'm so happy with um, the initial presentations, both by Martin and then by uh, Thomas de Frank, especially where they talked about Afrofuturism. But then there's um, some little um, development I'm noticing among some Africans, even in the US and the diaspora, who choose these days to call what they do African futurism. One word, African uh, futurism. And at the head of that uh, movement to reject the term Afrofuturism is the, um, uh, the African, the Nigerian American sci fi and fantasy writer, Nnedi Okorafo. So she and some other um, Africans. Uh, want to create a separate genre called African futurism, and they insist that 
um, that is more um, unique and more connected to um, the idea of futurism from the continent of Africa and not necessarily as it is being developed in the uh, Black African diaspora. So perhaps um, um, Martin and the Frank, if you want to look into this and let's see what reactions could come out of that. But it's, it's a new development and it's kind of been spearheaded by some Africans, especially in the diaspora, who prefer the term African futurism to Afro futurism. Okay, now for my own talk um, at this event, I want to focus on uh, what I titled a transhumanism, African philosophy, and an African enlightenment, uh, setting the agenda. And um, for this, I'll just give a talk. I don't have slides to, to share. Um, I'll just run through some points and then take questions and possibly we'll have a conversation. So to begin with, I, I prefer a particular definition of transhumanism from the um, Transhumanist um, FAQ of 2003, which um, renders transhumanism as this, um, this, this intellectual and cultural movement which um, emphasizes the desirability and the possibility of fundamentally improving the human condition using applied reason. Uh, but also, um, or especially, by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging and to greatly enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological uh, capacities. Now, my my main concern there, or where I'm really attracted to in that definition, is um, where it says, especially um, developing and making widely available. Um, these technologies that enable this human enhancement. Making these technologies widely available is something that um, some of us here in Africa, my African transhumanist colleagues and I, are always concerned about holding the transhumanist movement to account, to live up to that idea of making the technologies widely available. And um, this what we also tie into what has been said earlier about inclusivity, about diversity, about equality, and about justice. Um, it is when these principles are held on to and the technologies are made widely available, then we could say that transhumanism has really lived up to its ideal. So we are in Africa, we really expect um, representation, but also engagement in the transhumanist discourse and the transhumanist development and distribution of technologies. So that is where some of us African transhumanists come into the discourse. And that is where we fight for spaces and we also ask for representation and engagement. Yeah, but one thing I will also acknowledge is um, Africa or African transhumanists are a bit of a late commons into this discussion. And just like um, my senior, my friend and colleague, Leo Igwe has cited in a 2021 paper of his, there is this diet of literature uh, by African uh, transhumanists. Much of the literature on transhumanism has been centered on uh, the life worlds of, or the technological life worlds of Western societies. And it seems Africa had not been included in the debate. But uh, Leo goes on, to acknowledge that uh, from some discussions with Gennady, it was pointed out to him that part of why that scarcity may exist in the literature may be because we have few African transhumanists ourselves. So with the rise in um, African transhumanists, the literature is, is also expected to rise. And I quite agree with that. Um, before I go on to say, or to point out where I feel some of this uh, rise in literature is showing hopeful signs. I also um, read with something else Leo Yigwe says, where he argues that um, the use of um, technologies that would uh, overcome limitations of the human condition will be of greatest benefit uh, to Africans or will be of the greatest payoff to African, Africans. And that's true. Um, for much of our situation there in Africa, much of our economic, social, and environmental conditions. Um, it's, it, it, it's only 
um, life changing technologies that will actually bring the transformation that we seek. So the technologies that transhumanism promise, the technologies that will enhance or transform the human condition are also needed to transform the, the, the humanity or the human condition of Africans. So uh, in as much as the previous speaker had pointed us to the, the, the conservative or religious um, uh, predominance in the thinking of Africans, it is also an undeniable fact that uh, we need these technologies to go beyond several of our um, several of our difficult realities that we are contend with. Now, going or zeroing uh, in on African philosophy and how Has there been Jokwu? Are you? I can't hear you. Um, did he? Did we lose him? I think we might be having. I think he might be having some technical difficulties. Yeah, maybe. It's, so, he seems maybe. to. Let's add him. Should we add him? He's probably sort of getting, he was getting disconnected and hopefully he'll be, he's sort of restarting his computer again <laughs> or something. Maybe it's just the connection which was lost. Um, I was so much looking forward to him you know, further, further about the discussion on, 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 on Ubuntu. And the various takes on Ubuntu, actually, Leo. <laughs> you will give the presentation. You will talk about that a bit later, no? Yes, I will. Uh, I will make reference to it um, because it's important for us to begin to make that connection. Uh, but not con not making it a focus, but providing it as a as a basis for us to begin to make transhumanist reflections. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Do you want to use it sort of, um, is that part of the way you, you, you yourself are developing a specific take on maybe on, on transhumanism by integrating, by developing it further, maybe a proper uh, local approach sort of taking, you know, uh, into, in, into con consideration. With yeah, yeah. Have it, having the discourse, culturally situated, you see, because very often when discussions like this, transhumanism, humanism, enlightenment, when these concepts are espoused, there's a tendency to think, oh yeah, they're Western. And sometimes when people say, oh, these things are Western, they have a way of trying to shut out or think they are not part of the debate or they're not connected mm -hmm. with the debate. So uh, I'm trying to use, I'm trying to make reference to Ubuntu in my efforts to um culturally situate you know the discourse on transhumanism and and that might also sort of make people aware that it's not like in you neo-colonial stance but it's exactly. something which is strong yeah. resonated yeah. already part of the community which many exactly. people share no yeah yeah um, exactly exactly that this is exactly where i why i have to i'm making that connection because it is always very easy to you know, try to put a label of neocolonialism, imperialism, uh, uh, Western uh, labels on things as a way of uh, either disconnecting or thinking that, you know, if, if it's really alien, <laughs> yeah, um, some of these thoughts are alien. They are not. You know, transhumanist aspirations are aspirations that we can't find some antecedents and some embeddement within our own cultural narratives. Exactly, and and I, I remember actually um, at at an event at the Beyond Humanism conference in Lille, um, where yeah. you were the keynote speaker. That was actually one of the reactions from the from the audience was wondering, no, if you if you open up certain, this transhumanist take to Nigeria, um, yeah. uh, um, companies. Um, um, sort of the audience was actually wondering whether it wouldn't be sort of a way of destroying the local cultures and sort of this yeah. is in a way 
and I, I love the response you were giving then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you know, this idea, I'm also going to address that. This, this notion that, um, in quotes, either new ideas or, or they're coming to disrupt the authentic African. And when you ask people, what is this authentic African? What is it like? Of course, they point to something uh, that will sound either pre-scientific, pre-modern, and all that. And I ask them, how did you come about your sense of what is authentic Africa? Exactly. How did you come about that? You know, And if what we are doing in, in, in transhumanist discussion is trying to see, situate the disruptive thinking, disruptive technologies, why can't we come up with the same disruptive thinking when it comes to, let's mm. assume you have, you have notion mm. of authentic African and all mm. that. Why mm. also can't we disrupt that in order to make, you know, make way for something futuristic, you mm. know, something of course that brings up to date and brings technologies up to date and try to help us envision Africa, not looking backward, but looking forward. Mm. And that, yeah. I, sort of, I, I think sort of when, the audience was, was, was then the saying, so yeah, where, uh, when you asked, where, where did you get the idea of an authentic African from? And so sort of the audience was responding something like, well, I, I've been reading Nigerian novelists. Um, yeah. and, and, and I think your response, if I remember correctly, but where, where, these are the Nigerian novelists which got the training in Oxford, in Cambridge, in Paris. Yes. They are writing yeah. for you. you. <laughs> no yes, one, yes. No one was, in Nigeria has exactly. ever read them. No, it's, it, it, that is... <laughs> Yes. Yeah. You see, you see, the, the thing there is this, a, a lot of people, uh, writers, uh, you know, write in, they have an audience, you know, and that's why when you also get to look at the anthropology of witchcraft, the work, they are writing about Africa to the Western audience. Okay. Yes. And, and now as an African, when you read it, you know that this person is not writing, he's not writing for us. Yeah. It has an audience and that audience, ha they have, they, they have a kind of the expectations and things they want that will be find appealing. So these writers continue, you know, to, you know, uh, fall over themselves, trying to write something that appeals to them. But what I'm saying is that, yeah, disruptive technologies, disruptive scholarship, disruptive thinking, that's what we need now, you know, and it is within the context of this discussion within the context of transhumanist discourse that we can situate such disruptive scholarship and disruptive writing and disruptive thinking. And, and by stressing that sort of a lot of a lot of structural analogies, a, way, a lot of resonances there are between transhumanism and Ubuntu is a way actually to strengthen that, to show, uh, no, it's not something alien. It's something which is actually part of it and can get further resonances, further, further, maybe addict, uh, further changes, alterations. And as everything, uh, any culture is not, we are all in a permanent process of change. No, change, it's a yes. permanent process of adaptation. No yeah. culture which sort of claims ultimate validity for all times. That's the danger. What, what, what Thomas was talking about, the plasticity, what, mm. what, um, uh, Martin was talking about the plurality that mm -hmm. also has to do with with adaptation with changing with bringing about and sort of you know when when one has some cu uh, culture in mind which gets alters that has a lot of very conservative implications as if any culture was it was perfect as it is and shouldn't be altered at all no yeah oh, and if it, it's not just any culture but any cultural notion <laughs> okay because because remember you know, uh, these cultures are communicated by some people through how they frame them, through how they conceptualize them and all that. So it is important. And the, sometimes when you talk about, you quote, Africa and African culture, there is always this notion that is a kind of almost fixed, rigid, you know, as if when you talk about Africa and talk about technological innovation, modernity. Oh, no, 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 no. You're not, you know, no, no. That's not authentic Africa. That's Western. Okay, okay. You know, people think in these categories that sometimes inhibit, you know, uh, um, how do I put it now? You know, ability to look at some of these cultures, like what you used to say, in its diversity, in its plurality, and in its plasticity, like one of the, one of the speakers meant. You know, these things are not just fixed and rigid and, uh, and unbending. They extend, they disextend, you know, they cut their pieces, and there are individuals there coming under various influences, you know, and all that. And it is important that 
you know, these cultures are, are presented and represented in their diversity and in their plurality. And that is actually, for me, what I find fascinating, you know, when it comes to transhumanist discussions. I agree. Um, we've got a question, actually, you know? That's yeah, it. Um, we do have a question from Denora. It says, transhumanism is almost unheard of in most places in South America, like my native um, country, Venezuela. How did transhumanism become known in Africa? Well, <laughs> well the, it is important for us to ask ourselves, what is the concept? Yeah, you know, you might use the word transhumanism is English. But what does it represent? You know, he's talking about, I'm going to discuss that in my paper. I don't want to preempt that, but <laughs> I just want to, yes, I, I, that's why I want to, I want to answer this question by saying, look, in my culture, in, in African culture, there's, of course, there's this notion of magic. Somebody was talking about magic, you know, in the role is playing in the culture and all that. The magical thinking is always this idea that, so for instance, human beings could fly. Human beings could live forever, okay? In fact, there is in my culture the idea that there are, there are certain things you could do and when somebody shoots gun on, you know, and all that, when you see some African soldiers, you see them wearing some um, charms with them, sometimes they believe that you could shoot gun at them and the gun will not pierce. In other words, they, there are narratives of superhuman ability. If you go into every culture, if, if, when it, especially when you look at their magical traditions and narratives, for us in Africa, there are those narratives, but these narratives are, um, are fused, are forged using myth, cultural myth, mythologies, and uses in metaphysics and all that. But here, with science and technology, we are talking about a new way of looking at, you know, achieving these superhuman abilities and all that. And it is now using technology, you know, to achieve immortality. It's no longer using some charms. Okay, and all that. So we are looking at a situation where, like Otto C. Clarke would say, advanced technology becomes a form of magic. So, but we are not talking about magic based on uh, charms, but now we're talking about magic, you know, achieved through the advancement of technology. So that is where the connection lies. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. that even if, even when you go to Venezuela, if you go into the local cultures and cultural narratives and magical notions and traditions, you will also find, you know, narratives of uh, superhuman abilities, but of course, not as we are discussing today in transhumanism. And that is why we have to look at our culture, not only looking backward, but also looking forward, how science is beginning, technologies are helping us deliver some of these aspirations and not just something that is embedded in myths and mythologies. Exactly. And um, sort of, yeah, this is this is why sort of the, the notion um, which was mentioned, Arthur C. Clarke's, no, the third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That's really a strong insight, a strong statement in the sense, but as you rightly said, now with these, with these advanced technologies, with these emerging technologies, we can actually realize the goals. And as we can see in magic, in magical traditions, um, they represent that these goals are goals which are widely shared within the culture. Yes. Um, but with normally with the traditional magical uh, ceremonies, you just didn't realize the goals. No? Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. But with these technologies, you can actually realize what has been aimed at. And, and by showing that it's been part of the magical traditions, um, it, it shows that the goals are something which are shared, which are wanted. Um, yeah, and, and more importantly, the aspirations. Okay, you have to know now, I'm in Nigeria where you have power cuts. So you will see me, if you will hear me, but you will not see me for a while. <laughs> so they just took me light. Um, uh, so what happens there is that these are aspirations. Humans share. Yes, there are as human aspirations. And that is the, that's the universality. And that is how uh, uh, transhumanism resonates with all human cultures because the aspirations for instance the aspirations for hu uh, uh, human enhancement and but before now you know before the you know, all this scientific discovery before we are talking about emerging technologies some of these aspirations we are forged in myths they are contained in narratives of rituals but these days now we are now saying hey with technologies you can talk about resurrection you can talk Excellent. about immortality. 
Okay, so it's changing the narratives, it's changing the conversation, it's changing also our idea about the human future. Yes, because in some magical form, they will tell you, okay, when somebody dies, the person you know is living or something like that, or is immortal in this form or and all that. But what happens now is that with this technology, now we're talking about immortality, but delivered using technology, applying technology. So it's continuing the same conversation. It's trying to fulfill the same aspirations, but only that the mechanism, you know, being applied in this case is different. Rituals are being applied here. You know, myths, mythologies are being applied here. But, but in this case now, we are talking about ability to use technologies to deliver the same yearning we have always had over the years. And, and we, I think we've had it virtually in all cultures, you know, and all that, yeah. No, exactly. This is um, this is important thing to stress, and and thereby we can develop this. I think the sort of local localization is an in, in, incredibly important approach. So on the one hand, there are certain goals which are widely shared, like yes. expanding the human health span, for example. Yeah. That's I guess yeah. that's why we've had a couple of you know speakers today who talked about the relevance of you know dealing with aging, fixing the problem of aging, um, mm. because this is something most people basically agree with in some way they see it as relevant as living longer healthily mm -hmm. um, yeah. and that has been phrased in very different ways and mm. you can show whether it's, uh, in in some religious tradition that turns up as immortality whether that turns up um, in, in 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 a way of you know just explicitly talking about health um, for some it's intrinsically valuable to be healthy for others other goals are more important, but um, it's instrumentally very important to be to be healthy. This is this clearly shows that um, yes, um, increasing the health span is is something which is widely shared, and that's why it should be taken seriously. So it has been taken seriously in magical tradition, in religious traditions, but nowadays within within transhumanist, with the possibilities of emerging technologies, we can actually realize and radically increase the health span i mean as as was said before in the past 200 years it is possible it, it was possible to quasi double the life expectancy and now maybe even with with human animal hybridization it's possible to even go beyond the maximum 122 year lifespan which we have realized so far um so even because there are some crates the greenland whales who live more than 200 years there are turtles who've lived more than 170 180 years and that might be possibilities so this and this really sounds like magical goals no um it seems that uh, Jokwu is not getting back this uh, not getting getting back the establishing the connection with us but yeah. um um, we can we can sort of uh, then also move on to our next speaker, um, yeah. who's here with us already. And yes, Bernd, I'm so happy to see you. And Rai is is there to present him. Yes, we have Professor Dr. Bernard Klen Gunk, which he is a German physician who is specialized in granite science. Since 2009, he is president of German Science of Anti-Aging Medicine, which is GSAAM, and has published numerous books and articles on this topic. Currently, he is writing a paper. Uh, he's writing a paper science book on transhumanism together with Professor Sogner. As a young doctor, Professor Klen Gong has spent two years as a medical volunteer in Zimbabwe. He is also known as a collector of Contemporary African art, which one, which is one of the world's biggest collection in the field. So, Doctor Professor Bernd Clark, it is a pleasure to have you. Uh, in the floor is yours. Yes, why? Thank you for this nice introduction, uh, Stefan Leo. Thanks for inviting me to your impressive uh, conference. I'm very honored to be part of it. Um, and I'm honored, of course, because I'm not a philosopher, I'm not an intellectual, as you said, I'm a medical doctor, and uh, I have a special interest, of course, in anti-aging medicine. And, um, of course, uh, you already had uh, Aubrey de Grey uh, on your program, uh, so we are more or less 
working in the same field with the difference that I and my organization, we are a little bit more modest in what we are trying to achieve. Um, Aubrey de Grey is trying to end aging completely. Um, we would be uh, happy if we could prolong our lifespan and our health span by something like 15, 20, 25 years. Um, so, but still, I think we are uh, working a little bit hand in hand um, because what we do now can already be practiced by everybody. Um, what Aubrey is suggesting will probably become reality within uh, uh, 20, 25 years. Um, so the cooperation is um, we uh, see that you get as old to profit from the advantages that Aubrey then has with his uh, SENSE program and his clinics, which by then uh, hopefully will be established. Um, so uh, get um, uh, old enough to live forever. Uh, we see that you live for the next 20 years and Aubrey then takes care of you to live for another thousand years. Um, so that's a little bit my um, um, what I do in uh, medicine. And uh, what is my connection to transhumanism? Of course, as an anti-aging doctor, uh, I'm also uh, interested in longevity concepts like those of uh, Aubrey de Grey and, and others. So uh, ending aging definitely is a concept in uh, transhumanism. And then, of course, there is a personal connection to Stefan Lorenz Sockner. And at present, uh, I'm uh, writing a popular science book on transhumanism together with him, which uh, I enjoy very much. Um, still, when I told some friends that I'm taking part in a conference called Transhumanism and Africa, um, there were some raised eyebrows um, because people said uh, transhumanism, is that not something that is done in the Silicon Valley by some technological futurists and uh, what does it have to do with uh, what's happening in, uh, in Africa? And actually, um, I, I know those uh, raised eyebrows from uh, other fields as well. Um, as you pointed out, I'm, I once worked in Africa as a medical volunteer. That's a long time ago in the late 1980s in Zimbabwe. And uh, at that time, I also started to collect contemporary African art. And uh, that was something very new in the field then, um, because most people in the art business said, um, art in Africa, yes, there is this traditional art, ethnological art, and so on. But contemporary art in Africa just doesn't exist. Contemporary art was done in Europe. It was done in the United States but it was not done according to their point of view in the rest of the world. Um, and, and that was really the opinion at, uh, at that time. If you uh, expositions, if you look at galleries um, that were presenting art, contemporary artists from Africa were just not present. And um, there were then a few private collectors like me who started to collect this art. And um, it really took till 1989. Uh, there was then a big uh, groundbreaking um, exhibition in Paris um, called Les Magiciens de la Terre, the Magicians of the Earth. And uh, they were, that was the first big exhibition that dared to present Western arts artists from America, from uh, from Europe, together with artists from the then it was still called the Third World, uh, from Asia and and also from Africa, and at that time uh, this exhibition was severely criticized. Uh, you cannot put those people on uh, on the same stage and in the same surrounding and so on. Uh, just imagine, I mean, that was not 19th century; that was uh, end of uh, 20th century. And since then, uh, a lot has changed. Uh, a lot of uh, artists that were present in this exhibition 
have made an uh, international career. Uh, one of them you see, by, by the way, in the background, uh, Twin77, an artist of, uh, from Nigeria. He was part in this uh, exhibition. Uh, others also, like, like Sherry Samba from, uh, from um, the uh, Democratic Republic of, uh, of Congo, um, sculptures from Zimbabwe, where I had worked, and so on. So now they, they are, of course, part of the art world. Uh, art is not just done in, uh, in uh, America and in, in, in Europe. It's done worldwide. Um, and I think the same is um, true for, for transhumanism. Transhumanism is not just a European or a North American phenomenon. Transhumanism is now a worldwide phenomenon and Africans are taking part in it and they, they give a very good uh, uh, input as we have seen also in this, uh, in this conference. So that is the, the one thing. The other thing is uh, that then they say, okay, um, but um, from the uh, technological, from the industrial point of view, um, transhumanism is very much of a futuristic ideology and uh, in Africa, they are from the point of uh, industry and, and technology, they are they are lacking behind. Uh, yes, that is true in some in some parts. The answer is uh, so what? Um, for example, in economic science, we have now a concept that is called um, frog leaping or leaping frogs. And um, so, uh, what what do frogs do? Uh, frogs do big jumps. And uh, the thing you can do in the economy. So you do not have to have this complete uh, time of industrial period of industrialization. You can actually jump from that from the 19th century to the 21st century to the digital world. Um, uh, and, um, and that is what I see in many parts of, of Africa that they do it. Um, practical uh, example, um, you do not need a branch of your uh, bank in every corner of your city. You can now do all the business with your iPhone. And that is exactly what most Africans do. Uh, so no need of these things um, when you can do it the, the digital, the virtual way. The other thing is you don't need big industry. The industry of the 21st century is digitalization. It's artificial intelligence. It's happening in the world wide web and, and Africa is part of that. Um, so uh, you can do big inventions. You can create a new app um, in, in the suburb uh, of Lagos. And that is what people are actually doing. Um, so the World Wide Web is not an American European web, it's really a World Wide Web. And when they say it's, uh, the, the future is taking uh, place in, for example, um, in, the, in the Silicon Valley, there are now several Silicon Valleys worldwide. Um, I do a lot of business also, uh, a lot of lectures and um, give workshops in, in China. Uh, in China, there's Shenzhen, which is probably uh, almost as important as the, the Silicon Valley in the, in the United States. Um, there are centers uh, where they create um, uh, IT um, business models in, uh, in India. Um, and there are small centers already now in, uh, in Africa. So why not further develop them uh, into small African Silicon Valleys? The potential definitely is there. And you can do it right away. You can start a big business now with just uh, an iPhone or a personal computer, and you don't need an industrialized infrastructure. Uh, you just need a connection um, to um, to the uh, to the internet. Um, as I said, I um, I'm quite active also in uh, in China, and that gives me uh, a last um, uh, suggestion that I would do. Um, I have a connection with a uh, uh, right, uh, very um, rich Chinese businessman who is, also has uh, an interest in, uh, in anti-aging medicine. 
and he is constantly um, invited to Davos. Uh, Davos is in Switzerland, and once a year they do this economic summit in Davos. And um, he was very impressed by this summit, and he said, um, can we not do something like that also in anti-aging? So I do not want just another anti-aging Congress where I get all the doctors, all the scientists working in, uh, in longevity. But I want to bring together those scientists with A, politicians, and C, uh, and B, uh, also with, uh, with businessmen. Uh, so that they change ideas. Because I see that um, anti-aging is not only becoming important in the medical field, but it's also becoming really a big business. And it's also becoming important for our society. So I want to take this message out to the business world. I want to take it out to our political leaders. And then we really did this uh, anti-aging world or China summit uh, three times. And it was great because he was bringing together people from very different fields. And I think the same could be done also with transhumanism. Uh, why not having transhumanism world summits or African summits uh, where we can bring together all these people? Um, uh, Stefan and Leo are already doing this in conferences uh, like this, bringing people together from very, very different fields. Uh, but I think we really do have also not just to include um, philosophers, artists, and maybe medical people like me, but we also have to include politicians. Uh, we also have to include uh, business people. Transhumanism is really something, there is money in it. Uh, and that is, of course, what uh, business people are interested in. And uh, that is something I would suggest to do worldwide and to do, of course, also in Africa. So these just a few suggestions that I would like to contribute. And now, of course, uh, that's a 15 or 10 or 15 minutes I had for a talk. Then I'm looking forward now for the discussion. Excellent, Bernd. Great to have you. <laughs> um, you. I remember you mentioning wonderful suggestion. Obviously, you know, uh, longevity is definitely the topic which, in various angles of the world, would, you know, is something which your people everywhere desire and want and that's why here also in in um, in this event on african transhumanism we particularly focused we had a couple of researchers on longevity on lifespan uh, lifespan uh, span extension or increasing the healthcare um and um yeah i'm i remember you showing me some some photos of of artists also um you've collected who have actually engaged with cyborg with transhumanist material. Can you say something about him, her, who you've collected, the artist, do you yeah. know, who have in mind? That was particularly intriguing. So just to show there, there's like in, very interesting stuff on transhumanism and the arts uh, going on. Maybe yeah. you can say something about that. Uh, there are definitely different hotspots of contemporary art in Africa. Uh, one, for example, is in, in Nigeria. A very interesting one is uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, especially in Kinshasa. There's the School of Kinshasa. And uh, there are a number of very important artists like, like Sherry Samba and so on who are part of it. And there is now a new generation coming up. And uh, yes, and I was surprised uh, to, to see that uh, they are really uh, making transhumanism a part of their visual art. Uh, I, I have seen, I've even bought a, a picture uh, uh, from this artist called Laundry, um, which is something like, a, like an African cyborg, huh? uh, an, an, an African man connected with a, with a laptop on his knees, connected his brain uh, uh, with... Um, um, brain, computer inter interfaces, and, and, and so on. So, um, again, this is something that many people would not expect to be created in, in, in Africa, uh, but the topic is there. I mean, they, uh, they are part of the worldwide community. They see what is going on, and, uh, of course, they make it part of their, of their art. And, um, yeah, it's extremely interesting to, to see what's, uh, what's going on there. 
Leo, hi to you. Right. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Uh, I have always, why I'm interested in the theoretical part of our transhumanist project, I'm also fascinated uh, and I'm also um, anxious to know about some practical, ongoing efforts and themes. Where could Africans collaborate when it comes to the longevity project? Or how could the longevity project in one part of the world inspire Africa? Because actually, like, like we have said earlier, there are a lot of people fascinated by this. But sometimes due to lack of information, lack of net limited networking and all that. So and part of the things I think we could achieve using the trans uh, uh, using the platform of transhumanist movement is to connect people or to raise awareness. So uh, are there some kind of um, plans to uh, either connect with some people interested in this area, Africans who are interested? And uh, you know, I'll be happy to know. Or if there is a, some ongoing efforts, I'll also be happy to know. Well, first of all, I, I think the desire to uh, live longer in good health that's that's a worldwide thing. I mean, who who wants to die early and who wants to to suffer and who wants to be crippled by by chronic disease? Nobody. Um, so how the thing is how to really bring it to the people. Um, the the thing is that uh, in science, also in 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 medicine, people are already very well connected. If I if I go to big international congresses. There are people from all over the world. So the knowledge really is being being shared. Uh, even in, in Germany, we have uh, we have a few doctors in our society, the German Society of Anti-Aging Medicine. Uh, we have something like 1,200 doctors uh, who are members of our society. And there are a few from, from Africa and they, they come to our to our conferences. Um, the, the question is, of course, how to create, really create the infrastructure um, in Africa to put this into practice. Um, and uh, I think it is, it, is, uh, um, it is possible because um, most of, of course, if you, if you listen to Aubrey de Grey, this is, this is very futuristic. You know? uh, so this is very, very advanced. Um, but there are already now, there are a lot of things that you can do to really prolong uh, your, your life expectancy by rather simple things. I mean, the basis still is lifestyle, is nutrition, is exercise, is all these things. Of course, this is not something to completely end aging. But as I said, uh, this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the aim at the end. Uh, but right now, what we have to do is really to prolong our lifespan. And that can be done by, by rather simple things. You don't need very sophisticated uh, therapies for that. Um, another thing is there is now, for example, one drug that is tested um, to be uh, the, the first anti-aging drug. And uh, that's not a new drug that is ex uh, exceptionally expensive. It's, a, it's an anti-diabetic drug that we have known for 60 years. It's, it's called metformin. And there is now a, a big study in, in the United States called TAME, Targeting Aging with Metformin. Metformin costs a few cents. That is available. That's a, a generic drug. That's a, available worldwide. Uh, so once we have established this as the first anti-aging drug worldwide, um, then it can be distributed also in, the, in, in, in Africa at, at very low costs. Um, so this is not, uh, anti-aging is not just um, something that we do for extremely rich people in uh, in, in the Western uh, world. Um, uh, of course, there are technologies that, that aim it in, in, into this direction. But what is known now in anti-aging medicine and what is effective can be done all over the world. And uh, it just has to be uh, uh, propagated. Uh, so that is also something that uh, I would love to have the first anti-aging congress in, uh, in Africa you know, and uh, adapting it uh, uh, to, to what can be done there. And it, it can be done, definitely. Mm -hmm. 
Rai, you've got no, we've got some questions, don't we? Yes, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Mm. We have a question from YouTube, uh, Livia Michael. Okay. Uh, she is asking: Once you bring in big businesses, how do you ensure inclusivity, which is the GEDI? Are there ideas for institutional structure to embed that in some form of business ethics is transhumanism? Yeah, what we see, what we see now is that longevity is really becoming a big business. Uh, so, uh, for example, in also let's let's take again the example of the uh, of the Silicon Valley. Um, um, one one question that they always ask in the Silicon Valley is, uh, what's the next big thing? So, what is coming? What is coming next? What is the next big business product? And uh, definitely, longevity is becoming what one of the next big things, if not the next big thing. Um, so, uh, if you if you would ask somebody what 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 is your dream for the future, is it more storage capacity on your iPhone, or is it another 20 years that you can live in good health? Uh, probably most people would say, okay. I have enough storage on my iPhone. I decide for 20, 20 more healthy years, and that is what they do in the uh, in the Silicon Valley uh, uh, as well. Uh, and it's not only for uh, as as a business model; they they do it for for themselves. Um, and um, Peter Thiel was, for example, going to, to a, a clinic uh, uh, all the time where he got young plasma. So that was a concept that you could rejuvenate himself. Uh, by getting plasma from from uh, uh, younger pe people that are younger than, than 20 years. There's uh, there's uh, uh, good science be behind that. Uh, so that is one of the things. Um, uh, Google has uh, created uh, a company called Calico, California Life Company. The only aim of Calico is to really end aging. Same thing that's, that uh, um, Aubrey de Grey is, 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 is trying to do. Uh, Jeff Bezos has now... Uh, just uh, started a, a, a big company uh, where he is really buying the leading um, um, uh, scientists in, uh, in in longevity research. Like, for example, uh, uh, rich uh, people are, are buying the best uh, uh, football players for for their teams. Yeah, uh, so uh, definitely there is uh, there is a lot going on. Uh, not only because people want to earn more money, but they also want to use the new knowledge uh, about uh, uh, fighting aging for their own purpose. Uh, there is, uh, um, <laughs> there is uh, this saying, for example, in the Silicon Valley, that uh, the young people there, they want to get rich, and the rich people, they want to get young. <laughs> I God. think we also may, might be another question potential uh, from G. Stoyarf from YouTube. He said, it would be excellent for us to learn the names of some African artists who incite transhumanistic -humanist, themes. I think it would be interesting if there were from worldwide transhumanist community. So if you have any insights. I would suggest I have written actually an article for the transhumanist for the immortalist ma magazine on 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 this topic. I don't know if it's out yet, uh, uh, Stefan. It's not yet out know? out yet. Uh, later this year, I was told. I, actually, I the Nora is, is in the. Come out. Yes, so the... I have already written an article on this, also naming the the artists that are dealing with this with this topic. Um, so uh, stay tuned uh, and uh, look into the Immortalist magazine. Uh, it will come soon. Dinora is actually with us, so um, she's also listening, <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, yes, Natasha has also got a further comment. Transhumanist yeah. art... <laughs> yes, right, <laughs> please. Go for it, go for it, Professor. <laughs> Uh, well, transhumanist art is still alive and kicking. We are not using social media as a means for connecting. We aim for the quality of vision over the number of likes, followers. That is low art. So yeah, so there is um, uh, Humanity Plus is sponsoring that event. You're a sponsoring event in South Africa, also building a community that includes creatives, authors, musicians, designers, architects, actors, fine arts. This is some, definitely something to look out for. Natasha, and obviously, I mean, one of, you know, founding figures of transhumanism and um, 
you know, and she's doing an amazing work with Humanity Plus. So I'm I'm really happy that he, she's here now together with us. And thanks a lot for that for that uh, wonderful information. I have, I wish it was streamed, was available. I'm very curious actually in that event. Um, yeah, and still, I, I, still I think I think that the social media are, are really playing an important and and a positive uh, role in this, with all the criticism that is now about social media. Um, but uh, as I said, I started to to collect uh, um, contemporary African art in the 1980s, and at that time, for example, uh, uh, an artist in East Africa had absolutely no idea about what an artist in in West Africa was doing because they they just couldn't couldn't uh, uh, connect. You know, uh, even if you wanted if you wanted to fly from uh, from uh, Kenya to uh, to Nigeria, let's say, yeah. You, you, you had to, to book a flight through London or through Paris. Yeah? Uh, you, you couldn't go there directly uh, because people were just not, not, uh, not connected. Sounds like, like a century ago now, um, but this is only 30 years ago. Um, so uh, this now, social media, World Wide Web and so on, really gives us a, a chance to, to exchange ideas, to exchange art, to exchange concepts. And I think... That is especially important for a, a continent like Africa, where there is still a lack of uh, uh, infrastructure if you want to go from one, from one place to another. Great, Bernd. So wonderful to have had you with us here today. Yes, we're so <laughs> great to be with you. <laughs> Looking forward to meeting up with you again. And... I can already also say that I received a note from Chokwu um, that he's here, that he is here uh, back with us. So we we'll, uh, can make him join us. By the way, there's a wonderful comment, praise from Natasha. Love your talk. Thank you for all you do. Act Artists are connecting through the internet, messing in visual stories. Yes, I perfectly agree. And I assume you do too, Bernd, no? <laughs> I'm very happy. <clears throat> I'm very happy about the comment. And I'm, of course, extremely happy that it comes from Natasha Vita Moore. I mean, <laughs> this, is, uh, <laughs> this is, of course, the best you can, you can have as a comment. <laughs> Thank Thanks you, again, Fern. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me with you. And uh, you're doing a great conference. <laughs> Thanks. And now we're having Chokwu joining, joining, joining us again. <laughs> yeah. uh, hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> sincere apologies for that oh, a strange that disconnection in my, my internet. But I would say it's part of those challenges we face um, here in Nigeria and Africa um, with regards to our technological infrastructure. So um, and Leo Igwe will also be a witness in that. So, well, I wouldn't be talking about technological infrastructure um, today. I would rather focus more on, on philosophy. And um, like I started, uh, like I was saying before, my my connection broke. Um, part of the argument that um, African transhumanists make is for the transhumanist movement to live up to some of its ideals of making technologies widely uh, available and accessible. So it's part of uh, why we we engage in this discourse. Uh, but like I was saying again, Leo Igwe had pointed out another reality on the ground, which is the, the scarcity of um, literature on transhumanist philosophy by Africans. And um, he um, cross-referenced Gennady, who had uh, pointed out to him that it could be because of um, uh, the few amount, the few number of trans African transhumanists or transhumanists who are Africans, and that with the growth of um, African transhumanists, the literature would be expected to grow. And I agree with that. And um, um, before my connection broke, I was talking about why transhumanism is important in Africa and how its vision of transforming the human condition is also necessary in transforming the African human condition, first technologically and then otherwise. So now back to the issue of um, African transhumanist uh, philosophy, philosophical literature and the prospects of its growing, I see a fortunate a development happening in recent years, which we could um, look into and see as a sign that um, there is some 
um, emerging discourse in the area of African and transhumanist philosophy. And uh, I'll just do a brief um, sketch of the history of this literature, going back to uh, first, and, first and foremost, um, a, an article by Rui Sagai, which he wrote in um, 2013 and published in HBOS magazine, and uh, titled An Appeal to Transhumanism on the Question of Technological Inequality uh, in Africa. And that ties into what uh, both Ru and I, as some other African transhumanists, have been saying. There is this need for um, equal distribution of technologies, uh, especially by the transhumanist movement, so that justice and inclusivity uh, will be uh, well served with regards to African humanity. Now, uh, after his work, there was a kind of a, a lacuna for some time. Even if you go on the net, you hardly find uh, much literature on um, African transhumanist philosophy. But then getting towards 2018, um, a scholar from the University of Lagos by the name A.K. Fayemi wrote another interesting article which he published in um, uh, Philosophia Theoretica, and he titled it a Personhood in a Transhumanist Context, an African Perspective. Um, Fayemi, again, with a colleague of his called um, uh, Cornelius Ewoso, wrote another article in 2021, which they titled uh, Transhumanism and African Humanism, how to pursue the transhumanist uh, vision without um, jeopardizing uh, humanity. Now, these articles uh, try to argue for the compatibility of transhumanism with African, African thought, African philosophy. But then, on the other hand, we still have, in response to Fayemi especially, um, Amara Chimakonam, who published in 2021 again, a work titled Transhumanism in Africa, a conversation with Ademola Fayemi on his Afrofuturistic account of personhood. And she essentially disagrees with Fayemi. Um, she um, cited the work of another um, renowned African philosopher called Ifai, Ifai Menkiti and his own notion of personhood in Africa, which um, from our own interpretation, Menkiti, as an African uh, thinker, emphasizes what they call, what he calls the Afro-normative conception of personhood. And from her own interpretation, this goes counter to the notion of personhood that Fayemi was trying, is trying to promote as an African uh, idea of personhood and one that is compatible with transhumanism or what transhumanism intends to do with technologized persons. So in essence, um, Tim Akonam Amara presents an argument against uh, Fayemi and trying to say transhumanism is not compatible with uh, African uh, philosophy or African thought. Also another renowned and respected scholar in Africa by the name of Tadjos Mess um, disagrees also with these notions that Fayemi and Ewoso have uh, based on his own argument that um, transhumanism would fundamentally uh, undermine several of the um, uh, communal relationships and other traditional values uh, in Africa based on his own interpretation of African values. So uh, these arguments aside, what I see here and what I find as a positive takeaway is the fact that um, a conversation has been introduced, a conversation has opened within the space of African philosophy about transhumanism. So both those who argue that it is compatible and those who say it is incompatible, um, within that argument, we see that a discussion has, has begun. And I, I, I feel this is why I believe that with more responses to the discussions that have been, that have been uh, initiated by these scholars, more can be expected uh, in the growth of transhumanist literature uh, from the perspective of African philosophy. Uh, so I would... I um, happily welcome that, and I will say this is a conversation whose time has come. Now, um, but then when we talk about African philosophy, there is also much problem among thinkers within the field of African philosophy as to what African philosophy itself is. And so for some, African philosophy is simply um, a, philosophy, a piece of philosophy that is composed by an African person. That, for some people, is what you may call African philosophy. Whereas for others, 
um, African philosophy or a philosophy can be African in quotes if it is informed by methods, topics, and positions that have been salient in um, the philosophical work of those from the sub-Saharan African continent, okay, and particularly as found in African philosophical literature. So there are several understandings as to what African philosophy uh, can be or should be. Now, um, again, um, if we're the um, focus African philosophy on, on what we find in African philosophical literature, um, Tadjus Mez again um, outlines that this tradition of literate interpretation of African philosophy had gone through roughly three generations. The first was between the 1960s to 1970s. The second was between the 1970s to between the 1980s to the 1990s. And then the third between the 2000s to the 2010s. According to him, there is currently a fourth generation of um, African literate uh, philosophical tradition under construction. And that uh, is where I, could, I would say our contemporary generation of African thinkers are located themselves. Now, for, for me, or uh, if I may recommend what form of African philosophy uh, should be brought into engagement with transhumanism, um, I belong to the school of African thinkers who, so, who, who, who argue that African philosophy itself should move away from what a, a scholar like Pauline Hutonji calls ethno-philosophy. Ethno-philosophy being this, um, this collective um, anonymous uh, set of folk wisdom. Uh, we find it in proverbs, you find it in myths, you find it in stories, um, which several um, uh, scholars in Africa will say is the repository of African uh, philosophy. But then others will point to the fact that uh, first, it lacks, it lacks analytical rigor. Second, it lacks that individual um, reflection um, that, that you find in other traditions uh, which qualify them as philosophy. So, um, I and other thinkers within Africa would rather suggest or recommend um, focusing on the thoughts of individual African thinkers who have engaged in um, analytic, critical, um, rigorous, and reconstructive efforts on the resources of African philosophy, on the experiences, on the realities, on the values, and the knowledge resources uh, that exist in the repository of African philosophy. Now, with this, we, 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 we come in contact with several individual thinkers who have worked on various concepts within the African thought system that we can now use to engage with transhumanism. So when we um, pick up the approach of looking at African philosophy from the point of view of individual African thinkers, there are several names that we could, or several scholars that we could engage, and I will mention a few. Uh, we have the likes of Kwasi Weredu, we have the likes of Kwame Diete, we have the likes of uh, Peter Bodorin, we have um, Pauline Potonji, we have Kwame Anthony Apia, we have Tajos Mess, um, there is, um, in our generation today, we have the likes of uh, Chima Konam and um, uh, Aribia Ato. Now, these are Africans who have done very, very impressive work with several concepts to include the mind, to include body, to include um, reality, to include um, freedom, to include um, um, issues in metaphysics, in epistemology, in, in ethics, in ontology, and all that. Now, when we pick up the work of these philosophers, we can now use them to engage with transhumanist themes and concepts uh, and, and even problems uh, ranging from uh, the idea of progress, uh, the idea of reason, um, 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 morphological freedom, cognitive liberty, um, technological enhancements, uh, the idea of um, self-directed evolution or human potential maximization, uh, life extension, longevity, and other transhumanist values. We can engage uh, these concepts from an African perspective using the work that has already been done by these individual African thinkers, some of whom I've uh, mentioned already. Now, on the other hand, when 
we are uh, trying to engage this Afri these transhumanist concepts from the point of view of African, um, from, from African philosophical perspectives. There is also something that is likely to happen in the reverse. And this is um, a process where Africans will also get to re-examine and re-evaluate some of our own um, intellectual or some of our own traditional African concepts um, that exist in African metaphysics or that exist in epistemology or ontology and ethics. Um, the, the exercise of trying to um, engage some of these transhumanist concepts from an African perspective will also in reverse lead to an intellectual re-evaluation of several concepts within African philosophy itself. And these concepts range from um, um, sub, range from notions on, of human nature, uh, of uh, the body and the mind, of consciousness, of intelligence, of sentience, of sapience, of um, the person, of the community, of agency, of life, of being, of what an object is or what a tool is. Uh, as far as um, concepts on cosmology, on death, on creation, on evolution, on matter, energy, uh, immortality, space and time, and so on and so forth, all in light of modern um, ideas of reason, of science, of technology, and progress. So what I'm saying, in essence, is when African thinkers or when African philosophers of our generation um, pick up transhumanist themes and concepts and try to um, engage them from African perspectives. In reverse also, several concepts that existed in African uh, traditional thoughts will also be um, will, will also be given that opportunity to be retaught or re-evaluated. And some of these concepts have, have um, uh, enumerated also already. And this re-evaluation of these concepts will now happen um, through um, the instruments of, of reason, of science, of progress, of secularism, and other tools that the modern African thinker has at his disposal. So in modern African philosophy, we are called upon to pick old resources and reevaluate them in light with uh, modern tools of reason, and science, and technology, and, uh, and secularism, and naturalism, and all that. So, there's likely to be this two-way engagement between African uh, philosophy uh, assessing transhumanist concepts, but also some, um, some tools within transhumanism and science and reason also leading to a, a re-evaluation and a rethink of several concepts within African traditional um, uh, metaphysics or cosmology or ontology or ethics and all that. So from all this, what I see as likely to um, to ensure it's a new era of 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 of, of thought of of uh, of thinking of construction in African philosophy, and this new era has to be developed from the the cross examination or the cross evaluation or the cross fertilization of ideas from transhumanism and African philosophy. Uh, to me, um, provides an opportunity for a cultural reformation in Africa, as well as provide the opportunity for a new kind of philosophy that will set the agenda for a scientific, uh, a technological, and consequently an industrial uh, revolution on the continent. I will close by saying that across the world, or across the Western world specifically, several transhumanist thinkers um, relate or connect transhumanism with the idea of a second enlightenment or enlightenment 2.0 are some connected with a global renaissance or what we may call uh, a renaissance enlightenment or a new renaissance enlightenment. Now, here in Africa, uh, we've seen how in the 20th and, uh, and the early decades of this 21st century, several thinkers have tried to connect African humanism with the idea of an African renaissance. The task is still on, uh, the project is still on, but now that we are on the course of also building what we may call an African transhumanist philosophy. I will call on various or other scholars in this, um, in this space to see how we can connect this African uh, transhumanist philosophy also with the idea of an African enlightenment or an African renaissance enlightenment, any which way uh, it serves uh, 
the best. So to me, this is the agenda which uh, we can set for African civilization and which we can use African transhumanist philosophy uh, to achieve. So that's my um, talk. And thank you very much for having me. Many thanks. What a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm, and I, there's Natasha making an exceptional con uh, comment. The exceptional strategic plan to utilize, build upon the intellectual capital of known African intellectuals in philosophy and trans transdisciplinary fields. I would be curious, are there some specific Nigerian thinkers, philosophers you are drawing on? Who, who are the ones you would particularly highlight for Sorry? your are there some specific nigerian thinkers you would particularly highlight your work draws upon um and who you try to particularly recommend for your own approach um philosophical approach oh okay um within nigeria there's this um movement of philosophers it started from um university of calabar but many of them are uh, now in South Africa at the University of Pretoria, the University of Johannesburg. Um, the main uh, face of the movement is called Jonathan T. Chimakonam. And then there are others like Arabia Ato, who I mentioned. These are Nigerians. And they lead a school of philosophical thought called Conversational School of Philosophy. So they do a lot of work in African philosophy. They also give uh, organize uh, events which allow for um, some um, discussions about transhumanism. Um, Amara Chimakonam, who I mentioned, um, who wrote against uh, Fire Me, is also a Nigerian. And then Fire Me himself is also a Nigerian. Fire Me is from the southwestern part of Nigeria. So I could just, from off the head, mention about four or five Nigerians uh, to include uh, Jonathan Chimakonam, Arabia Atu, uh, Amara Chimakonam, who is the wife of Jonathan, um, uh, Fire Me, and then Ewoso. These are five Nigerian philosophers who are already engaging uh, transhumanism. Great. The Nigerian tradition seems to be partic and we, uh, particularly important. We see all so many Nigerians participating here in the event now. So there seems to be a particular interest in, in transhumanism. Leo. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, well, I think that, uh, like uh, the previous uh, speakers have noted, um, there's a lot of interest in technology and in emerging technology. And um, that interest is also shaping the way people think, the way they envision the future, their worldview. So there's a lot of interest, you know, in transhumanism in Nigeria. Yes. And, um, it, it would well off to and seeing sort of the, the interest also and given the literature, I hope you will, uh, Chokwo, I hope you will be able to write a book on your, spe you know, your specific, a specific Nigerian take on transhumanism. That's what I was hoping to get from Leo as well. I'm <laughs> responsible for, for two book series. Uh, and also another imprint of oh, yeah, publishing with this, house. With... So hopefully we can realize that sometime because that's really a lack in the in the literature, in particular from a, such a you know philosophical perspective, which would be great to have. <laughs> yeah, with um, I, I want to believe that even with what Leo wrote recently, somebody may want to come up to react against that, and that's part of the literature all right and um leo may want to um, issue a rejoinder and um, the literature will grow up from there same thing with what um fire me wrote and then amara wrote um uh, a challenge against his view that transhumanism is compatible with african philosophy yeah. and um, down the line fire me may want to also write a rejoinder to amara and as such the literature will keep growing now my in or um, in reaction to what you said, I think in a year or two, we may want to put together a kind of a collection that of the literature so far and then exactly. do a commentary on that and then see how how far we've come and then how far we are. We can still go. Yeah. 
that would be wonderful. Sort of a African transhumanism reader with sort of the best, best known, most interesting uh, articles which have been published already. That would be great to have actually as a starting point. Thanks a lot, Shokwu. Um, yeah. It's great that you also managed to be back here with us. Already looking forward to meeting up with you personally sometime. Have a, you know, thanks that you've been here with us now. And now I'm really happy for the next presenter who will be introduced by? By me. By I'll, <laughs> I'll be introducing Leo. I know we, we have, uh, I mean, seen you multiple times now and also seen your viewpoints, but I'll give you a brief introduction of Leo. Leo at the Department of Study of Religion, University of Cape Town. He holds a B uh, file and bachelor's in, no, a master's in philosophy from seats of Wisdom Summit Orald and the University of Calvary in Nigeria, and a doctorate degree from the University of Beirut in Germany. He has researched instructed interest in transhumanism and African religion and philosophy. So Leo, you may have the stage and I am, we are all interested in hearing your viewpoints. Okay. Um, yes, thank you, Ryle. Thank you, everyone. Um, the title of my presentation is uh, A Manifesto for Transhumanism in Africa. And I actually put it in a question, uh, I put it in a question mark. I, I wrote that you know, with a question mark. Yeah, is it or is it not? So it is within that context that uh, we're gonna have this discussion. Well, this presentation uh, outlines humanist visions and aspirations for Africa. It is not another declaration of humanist ethos because I mean, we have seen many out there. Um, what has been stated here, or what I'm going to say here now, has been captured in earlier declarations. This piece is a restatement of transhumanist intent with emphasis on Africa, or I could call it a transhumanist proposition from an African perspective. So this piece urges Africans, including, as we have heard from earlier speakers, African scholars, politicians, businessmen, theocrats, African schools, colleges, universities, companies, research centers, to get involved in the promotion and furtherance of humanist values. Emerging technologies are rapidly changing the world and its future, as we have heard today. And um, ideas that once belonged to science fiction are becoming part of everyday life. And Africa must not recause itself from this exciting endeavor and adventure. Africans need to be a part of this wave of transformation and overcoming. Africans must become active participants and just not passive observers of emerging technological possibilities in this 21st century. Too often, discourses on Africa valorize the past and they stress with nostalgia some fictitious, glorious days of yore. Africa is presented as estranged from the notion of science, progress, modernity, even tr technological transformation and contact with the West or anything Western or Eastern is seen as a form of corruption or pollution of the authentic Africa. Narratives of slavery, racism, colonialism, neocolonialism, imperialism, conquest and annexation. Yeah, I'm sure that's, <laughs> that resonates <laughs> with what is going on in Europe today. By other parts of the world overshadow and uh, overwhelmed debates on African and African possibilities. So Africa is presented as if the continent could only be understood through the prism of the past, through the prism of colonization, or in reference to the West, to other than African paradigms, or within the framework of Eurocentrism, not Afrocentric modes of thought. Now, mainstream discussions about Africa are suffused with exoticism and romanticism in trying to make sense of the strange African continent and its peoples, Western anthropologists portrayed Africa as other than the West or other than the white. 
They designated Africa as a dark and backward continent populated by natives whose cosmology was magic and witchcraft bound. We are going to engage this, this idea of magic later, because magical thinking, of course, is, some, is, not, is not something that we, we could associate you know, uh, with primitivity as such. It's something that also resonates with how advanced technology manifests. So Western scholars place anything African within an us-them analytic frame. And in reaction, African scholars largely glorify, glamorize, and uncritically present African cultures and religions. They take intellectual refuge in espousing alternative science, other than Western science, logic and philosophies, which are often not too different from pseudoscience, fringe philosophies, and paranormal idioms. Now, these models of thinking have continued to shape the way Africa is presented and represented. Now, a philosophical outlook based on overcoming human limitations through the ethical use of emerging technology requires a shift in thinking about Africa. Situating the radical and dis disruptive impact of technologies in contemporary Africa is futuristic and demands envisioning Africa looking forward, not backward, exploring possible futures, not fixated, obsessed, and held hostage by the primitive past. Transhumanism entails challenging and questioning the traditional idea of humanity, including the idea of Ubuntu, the idea of Ujama, or the concepts of one and one among the Igbos in Nigeria, and reimagining the notion of humanity. So it is necessary to begin to re-explain and re-envision Africa in futuristic philosophical terms. Earlier speakers have noted this. But this futuristic endeavor requires placing a critique of Africa or anything African on the same analytic plane as critiques of other regions and other cultures of the world. As in other societies, the transhumanist, the, sorry, the transcendent, that transcendentalist impulse locks in African cultures and societal formations. This impulse has been expressed in the quest, traditional quest for immortality, paradise, and the longing to acquire and exercise superhuman abilities, including immunity to any harm, such as gunshots or accidents, vet, disability or disease. For instance, in parts of Nigeria, there is a concept of odieshi, which literally means of no effect. Now, African, cult African cultures, across African cultures, other narratives of superhuman abilities and defiance of human biological, physical limitations and it exist. But these beyond human impulses have largely been framed in mythical, otherworldly, and metaphysical terms. But the emergence of science and technology has occasioned a rethinking of these sentiments and aspirations, and it has opened the space to imagine the possibility and plausibility of achieving beyond human capacities and realizing physical immortality, early paradise through the deployment of technology, including artificial intelligence, nanotechnologies, and bioengineering facilities. So transhumanism envisions the transformation of Africa from a continent that is characterized by poverty, hunger, disease, and death into a secular paradise or better, an extension of a global secular paradise. And the deployment of emerging technologies will provide cutting edge technoscientific responses that could cure, yes, these ills and banish suffering as we know it. So transhumanists, the works with optimism about the future, about the future of Africa and humanity and the world. Now, but in the case of Africa, transhumanism envisioned a qualitative leap. Yeah, I think somebody was, uh, one of the speakers uh, talked about uh, a kind of a frog jump. A qualitative leap in, uh, in the living conditions, including extended life and health span for Africans. And they imagine a continent populated by technologically enhanced or modified beings or hybrids that resist malaria. Yeah, HIV and AIDS or other diseases. But of course, it's not everybody that is enthused by the outlook of a transformed future for Africa or African humanity as envisaged by transhumanists. Some people have misgivings about these radical visions and possibilities that are disinclined 
towards this idea of transhumanist promise that it will free Africa from the throes of hunger, disability, and disease. And they imagine, they argue that this vision of radically improved humans is misplaced and will yield dystopian scenarios. So they think that deployment of emerging technology will worsen global inequalities and that Africa will be worse off as a result of the devastating impact of these technologies. They also claim that, that, that the convergence and the emergence of technologies will not change the biopolitical or technopolitical equation. That existing technologies, they have created a gap between Africa and the rest of the world. So, and emerging technologies, they are not going to uh, bridge this gap. They have the notion that, yes, that African continent will be disadvantaged and they will reinforce this divide between Africa and the rest of the globe. So transhumanism will face opposition from anti-Western ideologues or step side custodians of Africa. And as somebody noted or hinted, one of the speakers hinted, religious fanatics could also regard the human enhancement project. They could oppose it, regarding it as tampering with the sacredness of life or what is actually the abode of the divine. But look, these conservatives offer no better alternatives and solutions to the, to the problems Afri the African continent is facing. And um, transhumanism is not, is a techno-progressive outlook predicated, predicated on an ethical application of emerging technologies. And at the same time, transhumanists are not unaware of the harmful and destructive outcome of reckless and irresponsible deployment of technologies. Transhumanism is not a mere utopia. It is a philosophy characterized by optimism, but tempered with realism. Transhumanism is a positive outlook driven by the notion that these technologies could and will be used for the greater good of humanity, in this case, Africa. But it must be noted that new, new scientific discoveries and technological innovations have always elicited fears and anxieties. Alarmists have always tried to misinform people, discourage, oppose, or resist new technologies, the introduction of new technologies. And incidentally, this angst about the new, new technologies applies and will apply also to the social cultural movement uh, of transhumanism in Africa. So fortunately, as, the, as, as in the case of other regions, emerging technologies are making inroads in some African countries and gradually ushering a transitional phase of post-humanity. And in fact, transhumanism may signal an end to racial de designation of human beings. I noted this when one of the speakers was saying about, okay, black thought. Are we, in future, are we still going to be talking about black thought in the light of transhumanism, in the, in the light of the changes that emerging technologies are going to orchestrate? So also we are having data banks which make available repository information that could help achieve a better understanding and management of diseases and other threats to human life and survival. These data banks have been established in many African countries. While there are genuine concerns that these data banks could fall into wrong hands and be used to hack or harm humans, as uh, Yuval Harari has noted, transhumanists envision that these information depots could be responsibly used and managed to ensure more qualitative life and health for Africans. We have also seen artificial intelligence and robotic technology being deployed to improve healthcare in Rwanda and other African countries. And in the coming years, going by the trend, Africa will witness more deployment of these technologies and other projects that could cure death, enable physical immortality, and improve the health span of Africans. In all, Africa's slow and steady progress in the use and application of emerging technology has begun and will continue. And transhumanism, which maintains that limitations and miserable living conditions that have persisted could be overcome through ethical application of technologies, is said to radically transform Africa, African cultures, features, philosophies, and religions. Thank you. What a wonderful presentation. I share so much 
with you uh, on the general approach um and and this is also resonated now in the audience can we go to Stolyarov's direct question i guess right yes we have a uh, slasia loop that says transhumanism as a philosophy has technological technology at its root the adaptation of transhumanistic philosophy in africa requires reasonably impactful applications of transhumanist tech tech any comments on this Leo? yeah <clears throat> yes you see the the fact there is emerging technologies are being applied in america they're being applied in europe we can talk about them also being applied in africa so I, I don't know i don't know why there has to be a special discussion on how it's going to be applied in africa this is what i'm this is what i'm trying to this is what i'm going again what i'm arguing i'm disputing we are using we are, for instance we all I'm, I'm in nigeria and we are using the network nobody's asking okay ah uh, how are we going to do what are we going to do about the network nigerian uh, uh, telecom network you know will it will it work or will it not work you know you know just trying to create a space for a special discussion when it comes to for for me, for, for me the, the, these technologies will be applied to address human needs the way they are being applied to address human needs in germany in britain in the united states in japan and all that so any efforts to begin to have a special discussion on it is something I'm asking. Why should it be? Our, our aspirations are the same. We want to live longer. We want to live healthier. And we need the technologies here. No special discussion, please. So that's what I'm saying. So will it work? Yes, it will work, just like it is working every other place. Thank you, Leo. <laughs> Thank you very much for your comments. We have another question uh, from so Stolyar. He said, what would it take to turn transhumanism into a mainstream world view in Africa? Do you think this would be easier or more difficulties to achieve than in the West? Well, every idea, of course, will have their protagonists and antagonists. There will be people who, like, like, like myself, you know, I, I just want to say that I come to transhumanism out of fascination. Yes. I'm fascinated by the idea. And for once, I have a philosophy that looks at the future. Yes. Because very often, my background is in religion, witchcraft. Whenever they talk about, whenever they discuss it, it's like, oh, we're looking to the past. We're looking at how Afri great African witch doctors. This is what they will be reading in literature and all that. And the thing I just asked him myself, I said, what Africa are you talking about? What African are you talking about? What you want in Europe is what I want. Do you get it? Okay. Do you see? So every idea will have its proponents and you know, opponents. Okay. So as we are trying to introduce this idea, there will be people that will raise eyebrow, like people are called the, the Western ideologues, anti-Western ideologues, who will say, ah, yeah, you people are bringing this Western idea to come and corrupt our cultural ideas. But even within that, within the discussion, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of African philosophy first. I don't agree with. Yes, just like now, Chogu was talking about African philosophy. I'm having issue with many so-called African philosophers because they keep trying to cover a niche for themselves and say, oh, yeah, this is Western. This is Western, but you studied Western philosophy and graduated and certified and you, gradu and, and you finished and you are now talking about African philosophy. How do you situate it? So sometimes there's this kind of messy, mocky discussion over what is Western and what is Western. Look, what, what Stefan wants as a German and all that is what I want. And I don't want, I don't want there to be any special discussion when it comes to it, when I, when I want a particular thing he wants. So what I'm saying there is that there will be opponents, there will, there will be proponents. And, and the, the whole debate will continue, just like it's continuing in other places. Some people will think this is dangerous. Some people will think this is safe. And some people will make a case for it. Some people will make a case against it. And from there, the debate will be growing and developing. Of course, we will definitely have to tap into some of the ideas and debates from other parts of the world. But what, what happens is that with proponents and opponents, the debate will be growing. And at the end of the day, the thoughts will be refined and it will grow. So, so that's it. They, it's not going to take anything. It takes uh, African transhumanists 
coming out, speaking, writing, challenging. Like now, um, uh, Chogu is talking about Ubuntu Plus. I said, no, we have, let's go for trans Ubuntu. So we, in terms of trying to chisel and debate and fine tune and know what works, I, African transhumanism is being made. So will the ideas be there? Will there be people who resist it? Yes. But there will be people who oppose it. And, they, and in the course of opposing and, the, and the proposing uh, the transhumanist ideas, then at the end of the day, people will begin to understand what it's all about. People will connect it with their everyday life and reality. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. We also have a couple of more questions, but I think we also should start wrapping it up because of time. But uh, from Natasha, she says, Leo, what do you see as the most important technological project and preferred outcome that comes that can make Africa transhumanist success as a core African worldview? Um, I'm looking at the wrong question. OK, the question on the screen now. OK, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, the key technology needed to ex that is needed to expand and flourish. Um, again. I keep saying technology, you know, we, we don't, I don't, I, I think that there's something, you know, that doesn't sit well with me when you start saying, okay, Africans, what kind of food do you need to feed well? What kind of telephone do you need? What kind of internet do you need? There is picking, you keep picking us. You know, I need the same technology that Stefan needs, that Natasha, you need, okay? So it has to be available because we, we keep saying here, the human aspirations are universal. We want to live longer, we want to live healthier. Now, I'm also more concerned, let me say it here, about the technology that will get us enhanced against mosquito bites and malaria. Yes. And that's one of the things I was pushing some of our, our, our previous speakers. Can we go practical? Here, we need malaria is a huge problem, OK? So can we begin to think about um, enhancing, you know, human beings in such a way that a lot of people keep dying of, you know, of malaria here? So we need technologies that addresses these needs, the African needs, needs that have that are, are not satisfied over the years, or uh, companies are making business out of it. You know, like now, a lot of Western companies are making business out of malaria drugs. They keep you go to the pharmacy shop. You have a thousand of them. When I mean a thousand, I'm just saying you have so many of them to choose from. And after that, after a month, you have, you have malaria again. After you have malaria again, you keep going back and forth. So apparently, we need a technology first that will help us solve it. Okay, people are talking about vaccines. Why are they delaying? They have been able to release a vaccine. Uh, you know, is it vaccine against um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the problem, the, the Ebola. So, sorry, not Ebola. Um, what do you call it? Um, COVID-19, okay? Mm -hmm. So we've been able to get that Is it in, within a year or within two years, let me say. Mm -hmm. We have it. But we don't have a vaccine for malaria. We don't have something like that. And you ask them, they said, oh, the pharmaceutical company, they this and that. Now they are playing politics with our lives. So if you ask me one technology that will, you know, that will work, that will attract many people, is it is a technology that will help Africans you know, resist malaria without going back and forth, buying malaria tablet year in, year out, which is just making money for uh, pharmaceutical companies. Many of them are not even owned by Africans. That's glad. That's actually a point I'm talking about in, in classes on a regular basis because, I mean, um, 30, 40 million people get infected by malaria every year. Half a million people die every year from malaria, which is half a million people die every year from malaria. That's an incredible number of people of suffering. And, um, and I know researchers have already um, um, genetically modified the Anopheles mosquito who, who transfers um, uh, 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 malaria. And, and the ethical issue which has arose, uh, arisen was um, 
should it be liberated with a gene drive? Should one liberate these uh, genetically modified Anopheles mosquitoes, which, are, um, which cannot transfer malaria? Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a really, I find that a really interesting question because on the one hand, we've got, we have, and these mosquitoes already exist in the lab laboratories. We could save, you know, we could prevent half a million deaths every year on the one hand. On the other hand, what we would do is basically we would get rid of the Anopheles mosquito as it is right now, and we would mm -hmm. release another species, create another species, and sort of we don't know the exact interactions with the environment and so on. And yeah. that is that is an extremely fascinating you know issue. I think so. We wouldn't even would need a vaccine. We wouldn't need uh, any preventative medicines or any cure. Mm -hmm. But here we would could eradicate malaria entirely. Um, mm -hmm. Should we do so, or is the risk of releasing no of of releasing? Is it too high with playing around with the Nophilus mosquitoes? It doesn't seem to be. No, I maybe we think. should. Yeah. No, no, I don't think. I don't think because this is all about experiment, and it's an experiment guided by ethics. You know, response, sense of responsibility, and all that. So. I, I think that um, it is something that has to be done and it's something that I support, okay? Because it is in the course of doing it, we begin to look at the impact, environmental impact, what could be the outcome and things like that. So, so I, I think that, I mean, we're talking about gen uh, genetically modified food, yeah? And it's actually out there in the market. Nobody's asking what's the impact. Of course, we are studying that. So why not? Genetically modified mosquitoes, why not? So, so that's it. But somebody has posted um, a, a comment that uh, WHO has a, a, a malaria vaccine. I think I read it here. Um, they have deployed a malaria vaccine in that's last. That was last year. So, um, of course, that's that's okay. But we might also pursue it through genetically modified mosquito, uh, mosquitoes and also a vaccine. Why not? I mean, the ideas are there, the technologies are there, and we are here, and the need is still there. So what I'm saying there is that, okay, let's see how the vaccine will play out, but it does not stop us from exploring other you know, uh, options in terms of, because malaria is a huge problem here. That's, this is where I live. So if you're talking about you know, the, the technology that will actually speak to the needs, of Africans in this case, I would say that is, 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 is actually these technological uh, 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 facilities, you know, applied to address the problem of malaria, you know, of mm -hmm. course, of other diseases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful, Leo. Thank you very much. You brought really interesting points, and it was very interesting to hear. Um, yeah, uh, I guess we can go to Professor Hockner and. Uh, <laughs> Betsy will be presenting. Thank you. I think Betsy, you're mute, muted, no? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I said thank you, Leah, for all your insight. Um, that was very interesting. And I'll be introducing our next speaker, who is Professor Sogner. Um, so <laughs> Professor Sogner, as we all know, has uh, helped us organize this, um, has organized this event along with Leo. But aside from that, he is uh, a professor at John Cabot University. Um, He's the chair of Department of History and Humanities and a philosophy professor. Um, uh, he's the director and a co-founder of Beyond Humanism Network. And he's a fellow uh, for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, IEET, and also a research fellow at the Eoha Institute for Humanities at um, the Eoha Women's University in Seoul, um, and a visiting fellow at the Ethics Center uh, at the Frederick Schirler University in Jena. He is also an editor of more than 10 essay collections and author of um, many monographs, some of which include Metaphysics Without Truth, 
um, on transhumanism, and we have always been cyborgs. In addition, he is the editor in chief and founding editor of um, the Journal of po Post Human Studies, which is published by Penn State University. He's also in great demand as a speaker in all parts of the world, um, so in programs such as TEDx, um, the Global Solutions Taipei Workshop, and World Humanities Forum. And he is a regular contact person of national and international journalists and media representatives. Um, so thank you, Professor Schorner. Um, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, Betsy. So what I want to tr uh, address today in, in this presentation is a challenge um, which, which we're all confronted with. Um, but um, it is, I mean, all in the sense, um, it's a challenge of the influence of China and, and, and the influence has become particularly strong in, in Africa. And I want to highlight some reflections in order to stress where the tension lies and maybe some advantages as well, which go along with these investments. Data is in your oil. This is not quite the case. Digital data is intellectual property, while oil is a natural resource. However, both entities are connected with financial gain, influence, power, money. For quite some time, we've seen global fights for digital data. China seems to have been the most promising strategies for gathering digital data. China created a digital firewall, which has create, create, destroyed the internet as a global entity. Inside China, China has a political right to gather all digital information and they use it for the social credit system. Outside of China, digital data can be collected by means of Huawei, Alibaba and TikTok. The digital data is relevant for financial, scientific as well as for technical flourishing. If digital data is in your oil, then it is difficult to imagine how any nation can stop China from becoming the economically most flourishing nation worldwide. This analysis has various implications. The salaries go up in China, products can no longer be produced as cheaply as it used to be the case when China was still extremely poor only a few decades ago. They actually managed to make the, sort of that leap um, from something extremely poor, something now probably unstoppable economically. However, they focused on innovation and the latest technologies and were able to realize an enormous economic growth. Now cheaper workers are needed in Chinese companies, lower energy costs, as well as reduced expenses for logistical purposes. All of these goals can be realized in various countries, also in various African countries. Salaries are cheaper, the sunlight can be used as energy source, and the costs for transporting goods to Europe are much lower for, than from China. In addition, many African countries have important natural resources to offer too. I quote here, over a third of China's oil companies comes from Africa as does 20% of the country's cotton. Africa has roughly half of the world's stock of manganese, an essential ingredient for steel production and the Democratic Republic of the Congo on its own possesses half of the planet's cobalt. Africa also has significant amounts of coltan, which is needed for electronics, as well as half of the world's known supply of carbonatites, a rock formation that the primary source of rare earth, unquote. It is widely shared conception that the natural resources are the prime Chinese motivation when it comes to their interest in, an Afri in, in, in interest in investing in African countries. And again, it's simply another story of colonialism and exploitation. However, this is not quite the case and the issue is much more complex. And the following insight needs to be noted. I quote, the proportion of Chinese FDI into mining is 21% in 2020 is far lower than that of other countries such as the UK, France and the US, which is 43, 43 and 37% in 2019. Like more than double as high in most of these countries. That shows, no, it's, it doesn't seem to be the natural resources. It's not the case that the natural resources don't play any role, but the other factors mentioned before, like cheaper workforces play at least an import, as important role as the natural resources, if not a significantly more important one. In order to realize companies and to produce goods, what is also needed is a developed infrastructure and a high level of education. And China is involved in many related projects. 
Quote, the central players in many of Africa's biggest ticket infrastructure projects, including a 12 billion coastal railway in Nigeria, a 4.5 billion Addis Ababa, Djibouti railway, and the 11 billion megaport and economic zone of Bagamoyo are being developed via Chinese partnerships. Unquote. And these are all extremely big infrastructure projects. Education is another field which doesn't remain untouched by Chinese influence. For a long time, it has been the case that, I quote, China also supported African countries that opted for communism and positioned itself as a global moral role model, unquote, which is quite some problematic implications. Yet it also needs to be noted that, quote, since 2000, China's credit scholarships and grants to Africans to study in its tertiary institutions have increased to about 61,000. Over the same period, China has increasingly made its presence in Africa more visible by establishing more than 54 Confucius Institutes and 27 Confucius classrooms across the African continent. According to 2018 edition of, of um, um, Quarter Africa, both CIs and Cs are ma major instruments designed to promote Mandarin and Chinese culture in Africa. The South China Morning Post reports that China has been highly successful in creating a cultural footprint across Africa, the world's fastly growing continent through its Confucius Institutes, unquote. Furthermore, recent studies also support the judgment that the aspect of re cheap renewable energy is also relevant for the Chinese in investing in various African countries. And, and, and the Chinese are very good in having the technology actually for this re renewable energy. I quote, one peculiarity of Africa's renewable energy sector is a rapid increase and in likely future growth of Chinese involvement in large scale renewable energy infrastructure projects. Inside from other infrastructure, utility and resource extraction sectors in sub-Saharan Africa suggests that China is pursuing a specific Chinese model of investment characterized by enclave characteristics, including finance, um, turnkey project development and the importation of labor and equipment from China, unquote. All the previously mentioned insight reveal rather a double-edged sword. On the one hand, what gets imported is a Chinese culture, which implies a hierarchical and paternalistic structure. And that seems to go along with quite, quite a bit of the influence. So the right of morphological freedom and related transhumanist issue don't seem to receive any any significant consideration within the Chinese cultural structures. On the other hand, what seems to be promoted also are sustainable renewable energy sector, which is amazing to, to have that, no? A functional infrastructure, which can bring about lasting changes. And I've mentioned enormous amount of money in ports and, 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 and airports and so on is invested. And most importantly, an increased level of educational options which is good, which is extremely important. On the other hand, it also goes along with sort of the, 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 the values which are being transported that of imported from the Chinese culture. So again, it's, it's quite a double-edged sword. The realization of these changes might still have an, a significantly longer and lasting impact than the various developmental aid projects which Western countries have implemented in, in previous decades. If a complex infrastructure with a sustainable renewable energy sector can be realized, the foundation for a productive environment was realized. Um, Due to the relevance of this sector for central global challenges like climate change, the options for exporting these technologies and further growth are enormous because energy is such an, you know, such an, in, 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 uh, the energy sector and the renewable energy sector is such a flourishing and incredibly enorm, um, important industry. Given the initial implementation of companies with the support of China, the possibility of spin-offs can be realized. In particular, of the educational sector gets promoted further, such as human resources are available, which can bring about such project and put together successful spin-off companies. So we get more and more local, local companies uh, creating their own industry, promoting their industry, if one has the infrastructure and the education, as well as the energy which is available. A challenge which remains is that of the cultural and financial dependency from China. So various African countries have already reacted to specific attempts of creating such dependencies. So that's again the, the other side, the other side uh, of, of the coin. 
I quote, it all started in July 2020 when a Kenyan high court ordered the cancellation of a 3.2 billion US dollar contract between Kenya and China for the construction of the standard gauge railway, saying the project was illegal because the state-run Kenya railways failed to comply with the country's pr procurement laws. Also, Ghana last year scrapped a 236 million US dollar contract with Beijing Everyway Traffic and Lightning Tech Company to develop an intelligent traffic management system. And the Democratic Republic of Congo is reviewing a six billion dollar US dollar mining deal with Chinese investors, Reuters reported last month. Unquote. So, we can see the hesitation because it creates a financial dependency. At the same time, it must be noted that a better infrastructure, a higher quality of education, as well as a functioning renewable energy sector would also go along with some social prerequisites, which are of enormous relevance for most human beings. A well-functioning healthcare sector, for example. Most human beings identify an increased health span either intrinsically or instrumentally with a better quality of life. It's actually the health sector in which there's been a long-standing cooperation between China and various African countries. I quote, health is one of the oldest forms of engagement between China and Africa. Dating back to the 1960s when the first Chinese medical teams arrived on the continent to provide direct care to African people, build local capacity, train healthcare personnel, and construct hospitals, ultimately serving as a tangible expression of solidarity among developing countries, among colonial and imperialist powers. Health cooperation at this stage fed into China's anti-imperialist discourse, helping Beijing to consolidate its networks of regional partners. When the first forum on China-Africa cooperation took place in 2000, showcasing China-Africa relations to the rest of the world, health appeared on both the FOCAC declaration and action plan, the two official documents issued after each FOCAC. Through the focus on the health sector appeared rather limited in context and relatively low in the priority list, at at last, uh, the last of the 10 point statement, its soft power dimension, that means China's long held solidarity towards Africa, was crucial in counterbalancing the rise of a new, perhaps less benevolent logic of interaction based on inter of economic interest and achieving the associate foreign policy objectives. Unquote. This development has even been in intensified in mo more recent years. I quote, Beijing managed to achieve a number of objectives during the COVID-9 pandemic, somehow reinforcing its health strategy. The distribution of vaccines exemplifies this. Donation of Chinese vaccines to Africa is significantly lower than commercial sales. 6.7 million donations versus 47.5 million vaccine purchases. But Africa remains the second largest recipient of Chinese COVID-19 vaccine donations worldwide after the Asia Pacific region, which takes up up to 65% of the total share, showing Beijing's, Beijing's commitment to help the continent. At the same time, out of the 33 million doses delivered to Africa thus far, half have gone to Chinese strategic allies, so Morocco has received 16.5 million, followed by Zimbabwe 4.4 million, Egypt 4.1 and Algeria 1.8 million, with the delivery gaining momentum over the last few weeks." Unquote. From what we've realized in these reflections, there's a complex entanglement between China and various African countries, in particular the last one, the, the most recent ones I, I mentioned, the last ones I mentioned, which have been intensified significantly in most recent times. And it's closely related to ethical, political and cultural issues concerning emerging technologies. There are several serious challenges which go along with these developments, which have to do with paternalistic cultural structures. However, given the relevance of technological innovations for the economic, political and entrepreneurial flourishing of a country, an enormous potential for sustainable changes have to be noticed too. Given the enormous relevance of digital data and the variety of industries which are related to the processing of digital data, all these developments might promise 
a flourishing future for the countries in which these innovations get implemented. And I particularly want to highlight sort of the, 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 the ones mentioned last, the ones which also received a, a lot of donations like Morocco, Zimbabwe, um, Egypt, Algeria. They have been particularly um, supported. So, and this is something, um, it's a double-edged word, but it's, 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 it's an enormous impact which has been realized and um, yeah, um, many thanks for your attention. I'm looking forward to discussing that this critical issue with you further. Thank you, Professor. Um, we have a couple of questions on um, for you from uh, YouTube. Um, actually, one comment and <laughs> question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, the first one is you mentioned a hierarchical Confuci Confucian uh, cultural influence in China. Do you think this is an obstacle to transhumanism in China and a reason why we don't see a transhumanist movement there? It's a problem that very often sort of who pays the piper um, decides the tune. And basically um, um, the ones, if you, if, if China, and it's, it's not only in these African countries, the same happens in many European countries as well. And, and because there's such a lot of um, financial gain connected to these investments, it's, it's a fear of creating these dependencies, colonial approaches, um, and, and sort of taking over these Confucian structures, becoming a, a, a prerequisite um, for, for, for further continued support. And that is that is quite a very which I, not only I have, which is a very which is widely shared. On the other hand, um, on the other hand, sort of it goes along. You know, if you have a pro proper in if, if if the infrastructure gets created, if you've got what you need, if if they basically build the companies, if they produce digital goods, continue to produce more and more digital goods in the countries I mentioned, um, then they be, uh, uh, what is needed is, 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 is an infrastructure. You need, you know, a very well functioning fast internet. You need very good energy resources, which are also being created. And you need, they will, and, and sort of education will get further promoted and in general leveling conditions. And th these are wonderful challenges um, uh, which could be implemented. So uh, as a consequence, it's, it's sort of the, um, it's sort of the tension between the, how strong can one, um, you know, benefit from the infrastructure and technological developments and also which pr promote the usage of uh, or development of new energy sectors, which could even, which could be exported, spin-off companies being created. And that, that plays an enormous potential for future, uh, future developments. On the other hand, obviously sort of how strong is that, that dependency, the influence with the cultural Confucian hierarchical structures, which, which could be seen, which could be dangerous, could be problematic. Um, but, but I'm quite in the sense, I hope, um, that the other cultural structures are sufficiently strong enough that, though that it's not the taking over and one can benefit from the education, one can benefit from the infrastructure. And if this is there, it might be an enormous potential for embracing the latest technologies and gaining enormous financial, economic, life quality, um, um, healthcare system, um, educational system, which could really um, enable a potential for flourishing, which is, has never been there before. And we've seen the developments in China from one of the poorest, you know, extremely poor country to one of the countries, which is probably, I don't know whether their economic success can be, can be stopped. Um, I mean, concerning many issues, they've already overtaken the U United States. I mean, there are more peer reviewed publications in academic journals by Chinese than by US American scholars. And that means something. And so this could be, that could be an enormous, enormous, um, you know, um, a, a helpful starting point because infrastructure, healthcare, education is so fundamentally important and that would be needed if the companies get realized there. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for your insight. Um, there's a couple more um, comments. Um, I'll just read one, yes. uh, just, um, uh, Silasian Bilu says, for the majority, the exceptions have 
this beautifully powerful mind. However, an organic exception and momentum needs the majority as well. Yes, you can continue. Okay, is, it, no, is, there, is there a continuation of, uh, I think, a comment or something? Um, yeah, and he uh, yeah, previously said, imagination is the key and imagination is mostly cultivated by living conditions. Yeah, um, so for the majority, the exceptions have this beautiful, yeah. beautifully powerful mind. However, an organic exception and momentum needs the majority as well. Yes, but if the exactly if if, if sort of the um, the living conditions, the basic infrastructure get promoted, and you've got you, you've got a function infrastructure, sort of communication, you've got because all of that would be needed if they want to produce goods, if they want to produce computers, <laughs> whatever, laptops, smartphones. Um, in order to then deliver them to Europe and because like countries um, Morocco and so on and they're very close to Europe so the logistics would be cheaper that's that's another reason why there's an interest in, in, in these investments um, and then what could be provided is extremely uh, important for 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 many for the bright minds to flourish further uh, and th this is something which which, um, if if the cultural impact is not too overpowering, um, then I would see that rather as an enormous potential because it would be a sustainable, in a sustainable manner, the basic structures would be altered, and yeah. so I'm I'm quite hopeful in that respect. Yeah. Um, Leo, do you have any questions uh, for Professor or comments? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, Professor. No, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I think there's, there's something uh, I really need to highlight here. For instance, your presentation talks about, okay, China donated this, the vaccines, they made this donation, they made this contribution, they gave scholarships to mm -hmm. um, African, mm -hmm. African students or African youths. And um, I'm asking myself, yeah, I, I understand your optimism in the sense that, yeah, maybe this education could, you know, at the end of the day, provide a, a, a background, a literate background, a technical background, you know, that will help in culturally situating emerging technologies and the applications in the region. Yeah. But practically speaking, when it comes to the biotechnopolitics or the technopolitics involved, very often people who donate, donate based on their own terms and interests. And um, when they think that their interest is not being served, they stop donating. So mm -hmm. I think that there is it is important, yeah, while on the short term, you know, yes, we could, rely on donation of vaccines. Hmm. I don't think on the long term, um, uh, we could also rely on the donation of vaccines or it becomes a kind of a handout kind of thing. So what I'm saying there is that I think there's a need for us to connect these short-term measures, which might um, be a, a little bit of a token, you know, a, a country decides Okay, this three million vaccines should go to Nigeria, even though you have you have about two hundred million people there. Okay, there has to be again another another way of situating it in such a way that Nigeria needs to develop the infrastructure, not only to produce the vaccine, but also to be in the position to contribute to future production of vaccines for other diseases. So otherwise. The, 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 there will be continuous dependency and it will really hamper the ability for these countries to make meaningful contribution. It is not enough to be partakers, partakers in the sense that consuming these vaccines donated out of charity and all that. It is, but it is more important for them also to contribute to this process. So we have African scientists, we have African researchers, we have African research centers. So it is important that while on the short term, we could rely on some kind of donations, 
from China or from Europe or from America, there's a need to also highlight the fact that that cannot serve on the long run. Mm -hmm. There must be a mechanism for these countries to begin to develop the necessary infrastructure to contribute to the process. And that is when they will have a significant say in the directions of this emerging technological uh, 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 culture. Yeah. Exactly. No, I perfectly agree with you. No, um, sort of the donations, I just mentioned them because they they show sort of an, an interest in establishing the connection, an interest in the country. Um, what they are doing as well is to support the infrastructure because they want to build companies. They want to build companies to produce goods, to produce goods as well as f pharmacies. Um, which used to be produced actually in China, but in China, sort of because of the increased salary costs and for uh, and the higher cost for logistics from transporting things from China to Europe, it would make much more sense to do so, to do this in Africa, in mm -hmm. specific countries where sort of mm -hmm. because of you know you can use alternative sun. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, sunlight as energy yeah, resource energy, and, and yeah. the Chinese are very good in that and so they they try to use that implement and in creating the infrastructure to build mm. the, the the build the companies there so that mm. actually the stuff pharmacies um, digital technologies get produced there which again would make it a logistically much shorter cheaper for them to deliver the 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 the, the, the goods to Europe so it's it's cheaper and but as a consequence um and also local workers would need to get um the proper training which is also the the interest in the investment in in in, in increasing the educational sector and that um, educational local sector but what you what you get with the edu improved educational local sector is once you've got better educated people and you've got flourishing companies, you will get spin-off companies who again have have a good idea because you know they're pride people, they're educated, they develop their idea alternative to what has been used, and so there's you know one company and further spin-off companies around it, and this could actually you know exactly promote promote this this you know actually producing the goods by means of using the pride mines of the specific countries um and and it could do so because one needs a good internet one goods needs transport in order to to transport the goods and um that could have a, a much better and long lasting impact because the actual infrastructure and the educational sector gets altered sort of the worry i have is sort of the how much is a cultural influence? How much does China demand financial dependency? And and sort of to balance these two points, that's a challenge. But on the other hand, it could actually be because if, if one has an a increased educational level, um, more innovation will take place. People want to, the more educated you are, they want to vote for themselves, make decisions and not to be you know, being told by by you know by by the investors on what to do, and so I'm I'm I, I have I'm not a total optimist, but I see some optimistic sparks why it actually could, you know, could have a sustainable effect, and um, and uh, yeah, and that's why I just want to highlight that is it's 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 most often it's just being focused on well china is just want to take over the rest of the world basically um and but i i i see maybe it's 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 more or the initial point when i dealt with um china investing in 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 in, in sp uh, african countries was well they're just interested in the natural resources and then i looked at what they're actually investing in their investment in natural resources in the mining sector is much lower than that of of france and other european countries so it it's it's helpful the natural resources but actually the other things um, i just mentioned which might have a much more sustainable impact um might be even more more relevant or seem to be more relevant and so I see that as a slightly, at least, optimistic outlook for implementing, you know, the the, the and the transhumanist technologies we've been talking about um, in various African countries where these investments take place. And because China is just 
China's capacities in the digital sector, in the gene technology sector, you know, Europe cannot keep up with them. They are just, you know, much better. Um, and that's why if they produce the stuff in companies in, in African countries, that could be enormously helpful um, for the knowledge transfer to these countries as well. <laughs> Hopefully I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Um, we, I think you have one last question yes. from, from uh, Mr. Choku. Um, okay. Professor Sorner, what do you see as the impact of China's New Silk Road project in Africa and how this could affect the growth of indigenous uh, technological infrastructure on the mm. continent? Mm. And do you think the Chinese model of reverse engineering would be a good approach for Africans to adopt in trying to grow technologically? You're raising this important issue. Um, how does it, uh, how does it, I mean, that's that's been the central worry, um, which has been mentioned you know, by, by, by Sheila Yazanov, very many, many leading scholars or many are worried that sort of, yes, by, by implementing these new technologies, local structures, indigenous uh, technological infrastructure get, get, get destroyed, therefore, and that might have a particular impact on, like, if the, if the farming industry, there are loads of women working in the farming industry, so it, it, it radically changes the local infrastructure. Um, if, if the technologies work better, yes, um, I, I think this is very likely to occur. Um, that's what we talked about earlier um, with, with um, um, what, what Leo also mentioned, sort of, yeah, if we've got a technology which can cure a disease better than a, tr than a traditional technology, then it makes sense or more people will want to rely on the new drug which cures the disease better than when one fulfills a more traditional um, practice and um, as a consequence of this being the, the case yes um, um, it would it there's a high chance that sort of the the, the, the the local the indigenous technology industry would be altered would be would be reduced and that has a significant inf impact um, and and here I'm and and that is a problem of course however, if you get then better education in these places, and if you get, if you get, if you get, if you become the knowledge, knowledge concerning the industries in the gene technology, in the energy sector, and in the digital sector, um, then then um, it, it will be a problem for the ones who are directly affected, like the first generation, but the next generation. Um, will have the benefits of having the latest technologies and then to making a leap. And, and so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's always, it's, it's not always winning. Not everyone's always winning. That's it. And, and that's challenging. But I, I think, um, so if one has access for the next generation, for the ones who can benefit from the latest technologies, it would be in their, in, it would be in their interest to, to having access to the to the latest technologies and then creating spin-off technologies because they work better, because they have access to the latest energy resources and to, to really the latest possibilities, even sustainable. You don't need then coal and gas, but you can rely on the sun by taking the technologies we get from, you know, which were originally developed then in China. And so, um, you know, it's it's not just a smiling face, but I see at least some optimism, even though, yes, it does have consequence for indigenous technologies, but that might might be in the, you know, at least in the midterm or long-term interest of the places in question. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think... The discussion is either about indigenous technology or the one that works better. I think that's it. Or should we just hold on to a technology because it is indigenous? Or are we holding on to a technology because it is enhancing, it does better, it's more efficient? 
you know, he gets this done. I mean, if we are to do that, I mean, all the progress we are talking about today in technology, innovations, we are killing innovations. Yeah. So for me, if this is indigenous technology is not working, for me, discard it. What is all this romanticization about indigenous technology? You know, look, the indigenous technology of today, the, 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 the modern technology of today is indigenous technology of the next 200, 1,000 years. Yes, 1,000 years from now, people will look at it and say, oh, yeah, this is indigenous technology. Do you get it? So what are we, are we going forward or going backward? Please, if this is indigenous and it's not working, please discard it. Put it to the museum, you know, and all that. Bring what works better and let people, you know, adopt the thinking of the, of the more efficient technology, not necessarily indigenous, please. Because that word now is being said that, okay, we should discard what works better and hold on to something that may not be working because it is indigenous. Come on. Leo, I very much like always the clear way you put that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Leo, for your insight. Um, I think you have one last question, uh, Professor, from the Immortalist magazine um, on YouTube. Immortalist <laughs> magazine, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, could the idea could the ideal, I think, uh, or could the idea autonomy and self-reliance if seen in, in the service um, of collective perhaps help the acceptance of transhumanism in places like China? Idea of a, in places like China, I don't want to, no, it's, it's in China we've got a, it's, it's, these are two different cultures. Um, and, 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 and it's, it's very difficult. So changes in any culture, and that's why I love the cloakal approach, which Leo has been highlighting. The changes, they're always gradual changes. It's an adaptation, we, what we have, and then we adapt, we build upon something, we revise, we integrate something new. It's important to integrate something new. But um, if, we talk about, if we talk about here, um, suddenly placing the idea of Western liberal autonomy in China, these are two different structures. Um, and and the Confucian structures and uh, from from sort of traditional Chinese religiosity in China are extremely strong. They are very much a re re relationalist uh, uh, um, understanding, and you can see that even nowadays, um, sort of with a um, social credit system. For example, there was an example of a of a young boy who wanted to study at a university, and he he passed the entrance test to the university, but he was not allowed to to study because his dad, dad didn't pay back a credit. And that shows sort of the, the, the credit of the, you know, the credit of the son, the, 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 um, of the son was so low because of his being related to his dad, not because of him being, having passed all the entrance tests. And that's why, you know, there is a different mindset in the Chinese. So we couldn't simply imply, Im, implement it's 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 um, autonomy in 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 the Chinese system. There's the tension is too big, um, so such radical changes are, are, are you know are not are not plausible options, um, and that's also why we always whenever we have some idea we look at what is generally shared, you no know, like. Pro in promoting the health span that's something which is generally shared and then take into consideration the local structures and how how that has been part of the local structures and then try to realize that with something which has been proven to work and you know and and the the, the technologies and uh, you know the latest technologies have proven they they usually work better than traditional technologies that's why we rely upon them and we can use them to pr to promote the goals which are widely shared and which are usually also the local goals in the various in the various parts and that's i think a wonderful way forward to flourishing that's what leo and i have shared all the time as a, as a general approach and and i think that's that's you know that's that's um, a very beneficial way, so that in general the plurality of different types of flourishing can be realized, taking local structures into consideration, but also that what humans widely are interested in, like an increased health span. <laughs> so, yes, it's been a long event, no? <laughs> yeah, it's been a long one. But uh, I will say.
So yeah. we've had a wonderful evening. Say, uh, thank you. Right, Betsy, you've done an amazing job. Many, many thanks for all the preparation um, mm. and wonderful mm. moderation and technical services and structuring and organization, being in contact with all the participants. That has been absolutely spectacular. Thanks a lot for, for all, all your efforts. And Leo, it's always... Always a pleasure to do to organize something together with you and to be in contact to have exchanges with you. So hopefully, yeah, yeah I'm still trying to get you to write a book on on your transhumanist take for one of my book series. We'll oh, see. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The invitation is still there, and uh, <laughs> I have not said uh, no, but I have not said a categorical <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. wonderful. Um, I think now we've it's time for a general dinner for all of us. We've been we've had wonderful exchanges. The uh, the the, the um, video will stay on YouTube. So yeah, thanks a lot for all the listeners for the active part participation also from the audience. It's been an amazing audience. We've had some you know also. You know, wonderful comments and discussions, world world famous discussions who've joined us here. Um, Natasha Vita Moore, just being one of them. Um, yeah. And she's clearly, I mean, one of the founding figures of transhumanism. So I was very happy yeah. that she was here to, to join us too. Good, then have a wonderful evening. Yeah. <laughs> All the best. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 <laughs>